Good afternoon. Is this just for? I know. Let's see, which one is it? Hello? No? Test, one, two, three, four, test. Can you hear? Can you hear? Hello? Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear? These are new uh, little microphones, so we are gonna try to be um, direct. So if you cannot hear, please let us know. <clears throat> so thank you for being here. Also, thank you applicants for uh, working with staff. And staff, also thank you for your time <clears throat> and commissioners as well. For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. Pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County, this is such, this is statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Melissa, <laughs> do we have any changes to our ad uh, agenda for the day? Yes, we have two changes or two um, suggested changes. One is that we would move 300 Broadway off of the consent agenda to be presented at the, um, under new business and staff's recommendation would be to present that as the last item of new business um, after um, 1812 Fifth Avenue North. And our second recommendation would be to move the um, discussion for the design guideline changes and the consolidation to the end of the public hearing to allow people who are here for other items um, to go first. Okay, that's the changes to the agenda. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. A second. There's a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. Are there any council members here? Council member Tom Cash, thank you for being here. Anyone else? Okay. Um, also, we'd like to approve the minutes of October 16th. Oh, gotcha. Council member, <laughs> we're recognizing you. <laughs> Brett Withers as well. Thank you so much. Uh, approval of minutes, October 16, 2019. I move approval. Move approval. Second, all in favor? Aye. Okay, the minutes are approved. Okay, we will hear the consent agenda, minus 300 Broadway. So we have the administrative permits from the prior month. 300 Broadway we just removed from consent. 3927 Cambridge Avenue is new construction of an outbuilding. 3625 Richland Avenue, new construction, infill and outbuilding with a setback determination. 133 Bowling Avenue, new construction of an outbuilding. 1005 Ackland Avenue, new construction, addition and an outbuilding. 1704 Russell Street, partial demolition and new construction of an addition. And 1326 4th Avenue North, new construction of an addition. Staff has reviewed all these projects and finds that they meet their appropriate design guidelines and recommends approval. Questions? Okay, motion to approve. That's so moved. Okay, second. second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. Consent agendas have been approved. Oh, 
Okay, there we go, sorry. Technical difficulties. The first item up is a preliminary SP or specific plan review for 1228 4th Avenue North. It's a vacant lot in the east development zone of the Germantown Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Just to provide some context, um, you probably are aware that uh, of City House, which is just to the right or south of the lot, and just to the north or left of the lot is Barista Parlor in Germantown. And here um, is the context from a the one on the left is kind of from on the other side of Barista Parlor on the other side of um, Monroe, Monroe. And then um, the image on the right are the um, row houses or townhouses, apartment complex across the street. Uh, the application is for a preliminary specific plan review for a townhouse development. The existing zoning is IR. The specific plan request is for three townhouses facing 4th Avenue North and three townhouses at the alley which are, with a garage structure located in the middle of the site. Townhouses are permitted um, form in the East Development District of the Germantown neighborhood. Staff finds that the proposed setbacks all meet the design guidelines and the historic context. Vehicular access to the site will be via the alley, which is appropriate. The rear units will be connected to the sidewalk with a walkway. Um, staff recommends that a condition of approval be that the public sidewalks along 4th Avenue North be brick to match the historic brick of the Germantown sidewalks. Um, this, so this is a preliminary SP review, so you'll see in a minute that the drawings are not fully developed in terms of window openings or materials or kind of those design details. The idea here is for the commission to look at comments, perhaps make conditions or suggested changes on the SP before it goes to the planning commission and Metro Council. Um, and then if council approves it, it would come back to the commission with um, those kind of design details. So really what you're looking at today is the site plan, the overall roof form and form, height and scale, um, but not those details that will come at a later date. So here um, are the townhouses that will face uh, 4th Avenue North. Um, they will be two stories with a maximum ridge height of 35 feet. That meets the design guidelines. Um, and also meets the historic context or in the newer construction in the neighborhood. Here are the side elevations. I've kind of drawn on the site plan like a red line where like that's the facade you're looking at because it can get confusing. Um, so again, these are just preliminary drawings. We're just looking at the overall height, scale, roof form, site layout. Um, this is the rear elevation of those 4th Avenue North townhouses. And then um, this is the, um, the kind of middle building, which is about one and a half stories um, with a garage element. And that's the parking for those front facing units. Uh, here's the other rear elevation, um, the interior um, elevation. Again, these townhouses at the back are also 35 feet in height and two stories. So they, they're matching the um, scale of the front houses and then the alley elevation with the attached parking. And here are the side elevations. Here is a um, rendering um, that the architect provided, kind of how you would see it from the street. And another one. This is the um, a view from the uh, interior. And this is a view from Monroe Street, kind of, of the, of the um, back of it. And um, this is a view of kind of from the um, alley. So to sum up, in this preliminary SP review, MHCC is reviewing the overall massing and site plan of the proposed development before it's considered by Metro Planning and the Metro Council. Staff finds that the height, scale, development type, setbacks, and roof forms all meet the design guidelines. Details like materials, window and door placements, and all appurtenances, utilities, are not fully developed at this time. Staff therefore recommends that the commission make a condition of approval, be that the applicant return to the commission with the final approval of the design, materials, window and door placements, utilities, mechanicals, et cetera, if the SP is approved by council. So here's our official recommendation. Uh, we recommend approval with these conditions. Again, that the applicant return to us with the design details. Um, the applicant provide more details of any proposed roof deck in the commission's final SP review. I don't think I mentioned the roof deck, but um, it, it's possible that there would be a roof deck in these, the middle building. Um, let's see if I can find. There's like a flat roof form. There we go, you can kind of see the flat roof form. Um, there are specific requirements for roof decks, so we just would want to know that um, in the next more detailed round. 
And then finally, um, that a new brick public sidewalk to match the historic brick sidewalks of Germantown be installed in front of the development. Happy to answer any questions about this one. I'll go back to a nice view of it. Thank you, Melissa. The applicant here? No applicant. Okay. Open public hearing. Anyone here to speak on this project? Close public hearing and we will have discussion. Uh, Madam Chairman, this seemed like a pretty, this seemed like a pretty straightforward um, um, staff report and project and, uh, uh, and if there's no other discussion, I'll move for approval. Okay. So we're moving to approve to, for, uh, to be presented to the council then? That's correct. Yes, okay, there's a motion. Second. Second. Elizabeth, do you have a oh, I was just gonna say. Oh, okay. <laughs> All in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay. None opposed, and the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next up is another SP review. Um, this is for 1711 to 1713 Fifth Avenue North. I apologize. I just noticed that the slide is missing the fifth. I bet. Every slide's gonna be missing it because I probably copied it all. So it is Fifth Avenue North in Salem Town. Um, and again, this is a preliminary SP review. Um, in this case, the architect has provided more details than the previous application, um, but those can change. So um, we'll have some more recommendations that they come back to us. Um, so the um, application is for an SP development for seven residential structures at 1711 and 1713 Fifth Avenue North. The exist, there is an existing historic house at 1711 Fifth that will remain and six new residences will be, are proposed to be constructed. So there's a picture of the house and then the, the lot next door. Here is the proposed site plan. The two lots um, combined are 98 feet wide and about 189 feet deep. The two infills proposed to face Fifth Avenue North are oriented towards the street, which is appropriate. They have six foot deep front width full width porches and are connected to, with walkways and sidewalks. The front setbacks of these houses match the front setback of the historic house at 1711 Fifth, which staff finds to be appropriate. Unit three, the infill closest to the north property line will be five feet from the property line, that side property line. Um, and the three houses, including the historic house, will have about six feet of space in between them. The rear units will be connected to the sidewalks on Fifth Avenue North with walkways leading to the interior courtyard. The four interior units are tucked behind the houses facing Fifth Avenue North by being no wider than the houses facing Fifth Avenue North and by being shorter in height. These four rear units will be oriented towards the interior courtyard, which does meet the design guidelines. Vehicular access to the site will be via the rear alley. There will be 10 uncovered parking spaces at the rear of the lot accessed via the alley. Um, so staff does find that the overall site plan setbacks and orientation meets the design guidelines. Um, and here are just some renderings of what is proposed. Um, you'll, I'll show details here in a minute, but again, there's the historic house, which is remaining, two new houses facing Fifth Avenue North, and then four units behind it. Um, the four units behind are shorter um, in height, so are kind of tucked behind the um, front-facing houses. Um, so there are some changes that are being proposed to the um, historic house. Um, you can see from this 1960s photo that there used to be a shed dormer on the, um, on the front facade, that dormer is no longer there. The applicant's proposing to construct a dormer um, in a similar size and scale and roof form and staff finds that to be appropriate because there is documentary evidence of it. They're also proposing a two foot ridge raise which um, is inset appropriately and meets the design guidelines. Again, here is a picture of the existing house and then the proposed ridge raise. Um, so those are the main um, changes to the um, existing house, there's no increase in footprint, just the ridge rays and the, um, and the addition of the front dormer. Here are the Fifth Avenue North facades with the historic house to the left and the two infills to the right. The two infill houses facing Fifth Avenue North are proposed to be 22 feet, six inches wide. They'll be two stories tall with a maximum height of 35 feet. These all meet the design guidelines. Um, these are the um, side elevations. And again, the houses behind um, the ones facing fifth uh, will be um, shorter in height and like one and a half stories behind the two story houses. 
Um, we are recommending um, a couple of changes to the size and scale of these um, infill houses facing Fifth Avenue North. The first is um, right now on the side elevation, you can see that the, um, the second story kind of is constructed on top of the, the front porch. And that's not really a form you see in Salem Town or in many of our other neighborhoods. So we're asking that that front wall be pushed back so that the, the first story and second story wall are in the same plane and then there's a projecting front porch. Um, two, um, we are asking um, in this, um, on this one where there is no window openings until the very far back, the two new window openings be added. Um, and three, um, our third design request is that there are currently Juliet balconies and staff finds that those aren't really seen in the district and um, staff would be supportive if that front wall is pushed back, that they could do some sort of balcony uncovered on top of the um, porch roof. Um, again, here's the side facades, the interior, and this is a facade where we want the uh, windows to be added to the front facing house. Um, this is the other facade. And then these are the two houses behind the historic house, which are really small scale, one story houses that staff does find to be subordinate to the historic house and kind of tucked behind it. Uh, here's the rear facades, the rear facades of these buildings. Um, here are some context photos. Um, so at the top are the houses to the left of the site, on the bottom of the houses to the right of the site. Um, and these are some pictures from across the street. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval with the following conditions, that the applicant return to the commission for final approval of the design, including materials, window and door placement, utility connections, HVAC locations and appurtenances, if the SP is approved by Metro Council. Two, the second story wall, the infills facing Fifth Avenue North be pushed back to line up with the wall of the first story and the Juliet balconies be made more substantial to be uncovered decks over the front porch. And three, finally, at least two window openings be added to the left facade of unit two on the ground floor. Uh, with these conditions, staff finds that the proposed SP meets sections 3A, 3B, 3C, 3E, 3F, 3K, and four of the design guidelines. I'm happy to answer any questions. The applicant is here to, to speak to the commission. Thank you, Melissa. Applicant? Is that the better picture? Thank you, I'm Preston Quirk with Quirk Designs, architect for this project, and I just wanna say thanks to Melissa and the staff for helping to get us to this point. Um, my client is excited about doing this project, and we're in agreement with the staff conditions, and uh, I have nothing else to add. I'll answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Quirk. Open public hearing. Anyone here to speak on this project? If not, we will close public hearing and discussion or a motion? Well, I just wanna say, Mr. Quirk, I think this is a great project. Um, I like to see the modest houses behind the historic house and appreciate y'all's efforts here. So I'd like to make a motion to approve staff recommendations for 1711 through 1713 Fifth Avenue North. Okay, there's a motion. Second. Second, all in favor? Okay. Any none opposed, so we motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have 1022 Ackland Avenue. Um, and in late breaking news, they have just asked if they can defer. Because this is a show cause hearing, we do not have to accept their request for deferral. So that's up to you, is my understanding. Legal counsel can clarify. Well said. Thank you. So I guess you need to vote as to whether or not you want to accept their deferral to next month or if we should hear it today. Commissioners? So was there a reason for deferral with new information that would be presented or something that's changed? From they were unable to attend, okay. that's all we heard. May we have a brief overview again of sure. Basically, what, we're um, what we're deciding on? There's a violation. They, um, they constructed the project not in accordance with their permit. Um, so we are asking them to remit back to what was permitted. And 
if I might just add a little bit, you all have established a show cause procedure to allow people to come back to the commission and what is at stake is generally their permit. Um, inherent within a commission's authority to issue a permit is the authority to revoke it if it's not um, adhered to. And here we have a case where it was not adhered to. So the staff has brought back this case for your review. Um, certainly, you can do something short of that also. If you determine that you are okay with some of the changes, then certainly you can you know, approve it at this time or whatnot. But it's brought back because it is a violation situation. They came before you, they were granted a permit, they uh, constructed a structure that exceeds the <laughs> scope of the permit. And so now you're charged with determining what, if any action you want to take or what, if any action you want them to take. Um, so this is a little different than what we typically see because typically we see an application that is coming before you at the request of the applicant in which time we would have to um, mutually agree to defer the case because there's a provision in the code that says that if you don't approve an application within 30 days of it being complete and ready for your hearing, that it would be automatically approved unless there is an agreement. However, here, you don't have an application, you have a, a, essentially you're requiring that they come back and give you justification as to why they exceeded the scope of the permit, uh, what they plan to do about it, and what and give direction on what, if anything, you want to. So that's why this, this one is a little different, and if you want to move forward in hearing, hearing it, you certainly can. If you want to defer it, you certainly can. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, legal. I do we understand and do you have any recommendations vice chair uh, you know in reviewing the staff report on this particular project um, uh, it, it seemed pretty straightforward uh, however if the applicant you know wishes to present a case you know I don't have a problem with deferring and listening to that I, I, I don't see it'll change the outcome that much but it's the kind of thing that uh, I, I don't know that there's any real damage done with deferring for a month on this one. Does that? Yeah. Usually the only kinds of, uh, I guess the damage would be, depending on where they are in construction. Mm -hmm. If you give them instructions to modify it or do something different, then certainly if you give it to them earlier, then they will not continue to uh, expend funds toward the end that they're they're seeking if um if it's a situation where it's already complete anyway right. then right then there's no harm right. uh in deferring it and so I, I i defer to the staff on a recommendation on that based on where they are in the process i mean we can look and see they're pretty far along yeah. um but the project is pretty much complete at this point so right. from our perspective so legal by deferring it, if we approve to defer it, it is not gonna be like an automatic, your permit is good. No, mm -hmm. they would still have to come back on the date that you determine. So if you deferred for, <coughs> excuse me, if you deferred for one meeting, then they would need to plan to be here at the December meeting. And we would put that in our motion? Yes. Okay, um, do we have any other comments by the other commissioners? What are you thinking? All I right. agree with uh, Commissioner Stewart. We, I, I have no problem deferring since it's complete. Okay. So with respect to 1022 Ackland Avenue, uh, I move that we as a commission defer this project not to exceed one month so that it will be heard uh, at the December meeting. There's a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That motion passes. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is um, for a request for infill at 1514 Clayton Avenue. Uh, the existing house is a 1950s uh, home that does not contribute to the historic character of the Belmont Hillsboro neighborhood. Staff has issued a, a preservation permit to demolish the, the non-contributing house, um, and that was issued earlier this month. So the proposed infill is oriented to Clayton Avenue. It meets all required setbacks and will be accessed from the alley. Um, there's an existing front yard parking pad on site that will be removed as part of the project. 
As proposed, the, the new home is going to be one and a half stories. Um, the form as well as the overall height and scale uh, are appropriate for the context. The infill is approximately 90 feet deep. Um, so while this is a little bit deeper than what we would normally see, staff finds that it could be appropriate in this case for several reasons. Um, first, the, the lot is 140 feet deep, which is um, somewhat shallower than, than lots that the commission typically sees. Um, in addition, the, the plan incorporates an attached basement level garage, which meets all of the design guidelines. Um, also, um, about the rear third of the infill is single story. And, um, and, and finally, there are examples of homes with additions that um, are similar in depth to the proposed infill. So this is the, the right side elevation. And here's the left. Um, on the left, there are six windows that, um, that are not um, twice as tall as they are wide, which is um, called out in the design guidelines for being uh, an appropriate proportion um, for that, that, is seen, that is typically seen historically. Uh, staff finds that in this case, the, the three square windows at the rear could be appropriate given their location. Um, they're unlikely to be seen from the street since they're located um, so close to the rear. Um, however, there are three windows near the front. Um, while they're not square, um, they, their proportions um, aren't, aren't that twice as tall as they are wide. So, so staff would ask that those be revised to meet the design guidelines. And here's the rear elevation showing that attached basement level garage. And here are some context photos. So the top photo has the existing house in the center um, and the two uh, contributing historic houses on either side. Um, the photo below is a historic home across the street. And here are a couple of more uh, historic homes nearby. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the project um, with several conditions. Um, the first being the finished floor height be consistent with um, the finished floor heights of adjacent historic houses, something that would need to be verified in the field by staff. Two, the front setback be consistent with the buildings to either side, also to be verified in the field by staff. Three, staff approve the final selections of the roof color, porch floor and steps, porch posts and railings, doors, garage door, walkway and driveway materials. Four, staff approve a brick sample. Five, the existing parking pad located in the front setback shall be removed. This is shown on the plans, but we wanted to include a condition. Six, the three windows on the left side facade near the front um, be twice as tall as they are wide. And seven, uh, which is the standard condition about um, HVAC and other utilities um, that we would just need to approve those locations. So with these conditions, staff finds that the infill meets the design guidelines for the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Questions? Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Is the applicant here? Okay. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Discussion? You know, I think this comes across as a nice project and, and um, like you said, longer than usual, but pretty well proportioned for the site. I do think the staff comments on the windows were well taken and would encourage you when they when they come back with the uh, proposed new window placement to not only look at, it looked like there was a sort of random and haphazard mixture of double hung casement, single hung square, different proportions, different locations. And I think when you review the windows, looking at all those factors, not just the height to width would be, would be helpful f for the applicants. Yes, uh, I agree with Commissioner Stewart. Um, the depth of it, I think, is, I mean, I find it appropriate just since the back half is mainly the one story form. So I think that that point was well taken by staff and um, agree with Commissioner Stewart again on the windows and, and the comment from staff. So I, I'm in agreement with all the staff recommendations on this one. I agree with the two other commissioners and on with respect to 1514 Clayton Avenue, I move for approval. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed. The motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Next up is 
2121 Westwood Avenue. Um, it's an application for um, a rear addition and some other alterations. Um, you may remember this house. It came up, I think, a month or two ago. Um, it's located all the way at the back of its lot. Um, the house was constructed circa 1926. Um, in September, um, MHCC, MHZC disapproved an application to construct infill in front of the historic house. Um, so this is kind of a historic photograph which shows it, and then here are kind of current photographs. Um, Here's the site plan. Um, the applicant is proposing to construct a rear addition and also a front porch um, and also to reduce the rear and side setbacks. Um, um, there's a couple different projects of this project, so I'm gonna start with the rear addition and the reduced setbacks first. The applicant proposes to construct a two-story addition behind a one-story house. This slide helps to illustrate the historic house, house, which is shaded in pink, and the addition behind it. The addition will be 12 feet taller than the historic house. Its overall height will be approximately 25 feet, six inches. The addition requires a change to the rear um, setback from 20 feet to two feet. It also requires a change in the left side setback from five feet to three feet, and the right side from five feet to two feet. Because the addition is no wider than the historic house, and because the existing house has similar setbacks, staff finds that the proposed set side setbacks are appropriate and meet the design guidelines. So staff is recommending approval of the side setbacks. Um, we do have concerns, though, about the two-foot re rear setback. Base zoning requires a 20-foot rear setback, um, and the applicant is proposing just two feet. While the staff recommends reducing the 20-foot rear setback given the placement of the house on the lot, staff finds that two feet is not a sufficient rear setback. Staff is not aware of recent approvals by the commission where additions um, have been allowed to be less than five feet from the rear property line, and there are logistical reasons why two-foot rear setback is problematic. The two-story form, this is a um, rear, the alley elevation, with an 18-foot tall and 40, um, 18 foot tall wall, so the EPI is about 18 feet, and 45-foot long wall, just two feet from the alley, can reduce the visibility along the alley for cars getting in and out of garages and for garages and for cars going through the alley. Metro Public Works staff wrote to MHCC expressing concern about a two-foot setback in this location. The email states that Public Works would not be supportive of a two-foot setback, as it could not interfere with as it could interfere with obtaining Public Works desired 20-foot of right-of-way in the future. A five-foot rear setback would be the minimal appropriate setback for an addition of the size. Staff recommends that the rear setback be at least five feet. While the commission does have the ability to set the setbacks, staff cautions against reducing rear setbacks when another metro agency has stated that they do not support the two-foot rear setback. Um, here are just some pictures along the alley. Um, you can kind of see the house in question is, is kind of like the reddish, pinkish, I guess, um, house in the middle, and the other two structures on either side of it are um, uh, garages, um, which I'm assuming we approve, but I didn't look that up. Okay, so we'll go back to the addition. Um, the rear addition will be a two-story form behind a one-story house. Uh, again, it'll be about 12 feet taller um, than the historic house. And you know, typically, as you know, um, the commission doesn't want to see anything more than two feet taller. We've said in, in some cases that up to four feet could be okay. Um, this is 12 feet. Um, staff is saying that 12 feet could be okay with some changes, mainly because there's not really much room in the back of the lot to do much of anything. Um, you know, it's there's about 20 foot of space back there, so if you if they do the five foot setback, which we're asking for, that's really just about 15 feet of depth. And so, um, because this is located all the way at the rear of the lot, it'll be less visible, and because of the constraints of the lot, um, staff is saying that a two story um, addition of this height uh, could be okay. Um, but that said, staff does have rec two recommended changes to the scale of the house to bring it more into compliance with the design guidelines and the scale. Um, first, staff recommends that the depth of the rear addition be reduced by three feet so that it can meet that five foot setback. Um, second, staff recommends that the two story portion um, of the addition, which you can kind of see here in pink, we're asking that that part not be two stories, but just be one story in height. Um, again, that, that, that small porch slash port cochere um, it's kind of like an add-on to the house. I think it's original, but um, we just found that the the scale of the overall project would be improved if it was just the two-story portion behind the main portion of the house. Um, here are the side elevations. Um, staff um, is supportive of the fact that the you know the two-story portion is kind of set 
behind the house. It's not really going over on top of the roof. It's tied in nicely. So staff um, is supportive of that. So now we're gonna to switch to the application to construct a rear front porch. Um, the applicant is intending to create a door opening and construct a new front porch on the front facade. The current house does not have a front entry. One would enter through the side port cochere or side porch. Um, it is unusual for houses of this era to have to not have front porch or front porches or front entryways. Um, it was kind of common in the 1920s, 1930s era to have um, side entries um, for houses. Um, but in this case, there is histor there is documentary evidence that there was a porch there at one time. So these are the 1931 and the 1957 Sanborn maps. Um, for those of you who don't look at Sanborn maps all day like we do sometimes, um, the kind of the dashed parts of the map mean that it's like an open porch or some sort of covered part of the house but open in nature. So you can see that there was once um, some sort of modestly scaled front porch um, at the front and one would assume if there was a front porch there's probably also a door. So that's, don't have any pictures of it but we would assume that there'd be a door if there's a porch. Um, so we are supportive of adding a front porch. Um, but we do have some concerns about, concerns about the scale of the proposed porch. Um, the um, Sandboard maps that we have are one one hundredth scale, which is kind of small. So to our best estimate, we can guess that, or not guess, but we can measure that it's you know between four and six feet um, deep and about 10 to 12 feet wide. Um, and uh, so we would say that the maximum of that should be 12 feet by six feet by 12 feet. Um, what the applicant is proposing is something that's much deeper and a little bit wider, um, 12 foot, four inches deep by five foot, one inches wide or 15 feet, one inches wide. Um, so again, staff is recommending that that front porch be reduced to be more in keeping with what the scale of it would have been originally, which was kind of a modestly scaled front porch, um, which is six feet by 12 feet maximum in, in size. Um, here's a side elevation, just kind of showing the depth of that front porch. Um, it looks like the applicant is proposing to screen the front porch. Um, that's technically not something that the commission reviews, so um, we didn't have an opinion on that. Um, the applicant is also proposing to enclose the side. I think it was originally a port cochere. It's more recently been used as a side porch. Um, that is something that the commission has approved in the past, and particularly since it's more open and it's open in nature, um, staff is supportive of enclosing that to be um, either screened or, or glassed in space. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval of the applications with these conditions. The front porch be reduced in size to be no deeper than 10 to 12 feet wide and four to six feet deep. The rear addition be no closer than five feet from the rear property line. The section of the addition behind the side port or porch or port cachere be one story in height. Um, again, staff approve all the windows and doors, the roof color, the foundation material of the addition, um, and the material of the driveway and parking pad. With these conditions, staff finds that the proposed infill meets section 2B and 3B of the Hillsborough West End Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. You know, it's kind of a complicated project. I'm ha happy to answer questions before turning it over to the um, applicants. Staff, thank you for working on that. That, that was a uh, challenging project, so. Thank you for working with the applicant and as also the applicant. Um, applicant? I, I do have one question about the porch. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you, you said that it looked like Sanborn may have been four to six feet deep, but one of the things I found is with a, with a porch that deep, there's rarely enough room for both furniture and people on mm -hmm. it. Uh, you know, would it be awful to reduce that from the 12 floor they asked for to say eight feet? Um, I think staff could be supportive deep. of that if that's the way the commission would like to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa? Uh, ha have we seen this property before and he wanted to build a house, house in front? Yes. Now, so, yes. So he's really kind of struggling yeah. to... Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So they had um, they had applied, uh, it says September, I was thinking maybe it was October, but recently in the recent, in the fall, um, to uh, build an infill in front of the historic house. The commission um, determined that that was not appropriate. So they're trying to find a way to, to make this property work for them. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good afternoon, my name is Blaine Bonadis. Uh, I was here actually last month um, with the proposal in front of you um, for the infill. Uh, since we've gone back to staff, <clears throat> we've asked him um, to help us figure out how we could add on to the back of this. Um, <clears throat> it was maybe about six months ago 
was our initial conversation um, where Tim Walker was present. Uh, Tim said to us they would be amenable to a zero foot setback in the rear. Um, we offered a, uh, a two foot setback um, uh, as a compromise, I think, to just the practicality of not going all the way to the rear property line. We submitted as such and we designed as such. And then um, after we submitted, staff came back to us and said, no, we actually would like five instead. So we're kind of stuck there in terms of what we were offered, what we thought we were compromising to, and now what we are being sort of penalized further for. If you, um, if you consider um, the rear being 20, take two feet off of that, you're left with about 18 feet. If we take an additional three feet off of that, which would be the so five foot setback, we'd be left with about a 15 foot addition across the back of that house. A three foot six inch stairwell, if it's a straight run and not a double back run, is three feet six inches and a hallway is three feet six inches. You're at seven feet, you're already at 50% of the 15 feet that you've allowed for us in the back. And I think um, in terms of what we're trying to achieve here, given the fact that we've been painted into this co corner, every inch, every, um, every bit of square footage that we can get for this addition is really what we need um, in terms of what we wanted to do and what we're willing to compromise for. So I would like you know, your understanding in terms of what we're trying to achieve from a practical standpoint of making rooms fit inside the back of this 750 square foot house. Um, I don't have my notes in the same order. I did them um, as front porch and then um, the setback, but I guess I guess we can talk about the setbacks first. I think I covered most of that. Um, I guess the last point that I that I made in my notes was that you know every additional foot that we can get in the back, uh, particularly in terms of floor planning and space planning, is absolutely critical to making this project work. Um, and I th and I think you know I think we should make some some concessions to these folks who have, you know, literally been painted into the back corner of their lot. Um, front porch, that's my next point. I'm trying to speed this up so I can not use all of my time. Um, the front porch, in my mind, sits back 140 feet from the, from the front setback. It doesn't impact really anybody. You really can't visually see it. Um, if you look at the true elevation, um, we're talking about basically the same width as what staff is. It's a little deeper. And if you're gonna go um, you know, a little deeper, let's get 12 feet so that we can get, again, spatially a piece of furniture that you can actually sit around. And we wanna do this so, because we've lost our backyard. And with small kids, you know, we have a place now to corral these kids and a place to enjoy this big giant front yard that we now have to um, manage. And so in terms of fencing in that whole front yard or adding two or three feet to this front porch, which really doesn't impact the house whatsoever, in terms of putting something on the front of the house, once you put something on the front of the house, you've changed the front of the house. So what difference does it make if it's a couple more feet deep um, in terms of you know, the architecture, but in terms of functionality, it makes a huge difference to the, to the, to the you know, inhabitant of this house, particularly with little kids. And that's why we have screened it in because it's you know, in, some, in some shape or form, you know, somewhat of a playpen out there. Um, and then it enables us not to have to fence in that 150 feet or so. Um, so that's, that's my point about the front porch. Um, Lastly, was the second story behind the enclosed porch. Um, given the confines of the, the rear yard, every bit of the square footage counts. Um, in terms of programmatic requirements beyond the inhabitable space, um, we need stairs, we need hallways, we need vertical circulation, um, and we need horizontal circulation in terms of being able to move through that 15 foot or that 18 foot addition that we have off the back. Um, we need things for utility space. We need a laundry room. We need storage. We need uh, mechanical rooms. And so in order to have that additional space on the second story, again, is kind of critical to making this whole thing work. It really is the kind of straw that will break the camel's back if we can't do this. Um, 
The setbacks on the sides, um, I think that uh, historically we understand that this lot was divided, subdivided during, at, at some point in time. And so it made that house tight to the side setbacks anyway. It's just kind of product of what it is and what it became. And so our addition is literally the same width as the house. So we're not asking for anything wider. We're just basically gonna continue that setback. So not any more, not any less, just what it is. Um, I think I think that's it. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but the owner may or may not want to say something. Oh, there it is. And I'd like to reserve that two minutes if possible. Well, that two minutes would be, or four minutes would be for rebuttal from the public. Okay, okay. Okay, open public hearing. Oh, other applicant. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, is that correct? Oh, please come forward. Uh, hi, my name is Roland Stebbins. I'm the owner of uh, 2121 Westwood Avenue. I, forgive me if I repeat anything that Blaine said, but uh, I just want to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, the front porch is really uh, critical. The, the difference between uh, a, a six foot depth and say a 10 or even 12 foot depth on the front porch makes all the difference in terms of the experience of living there, uh, being able to house, as you mentioned, you know, furniture. And uh, since we have no backyard, uh, we are all front yard. And so this would be a chance to have something equivalent of a deck or a porch uh, that kind of you know, announces itself to the green area. Um, and it's also, the, currently the porch cochere is sort of our, 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 our sort of covered protected outdoor space. And so this would replace it um, the, the porch cochere currently is about 288 square feet, I think. And so something, you know, less, just about half of that, um, is what we'd like on the front porch, uh, both to replace that and to give us again, some sort of covered outdoor living area. Um, in terms of the rear, uh, setback, uh, there is a fence, as you can see from the photograph that sits two feet from the alley. That's been there for the entire 16 years that I've owned the house, and for all I know was there you know, well before uh, I purchased it. Uh, it's, never present, it's, it's never been dinged, it's never presented a problem. The alley is wide enough to accommodate all of the you know, utility trucks and things that go through it. Uh, my neighbor's fence, as you can see, is also, uh, I measured is about two feet I want to say three or four inches from the curb. Uh, furthermore, that curb is elevated, uh, and so sort of, it kind of acts as a barrier uh, between uh, the alley and uh, and the property. And so, it, it in terms of it, you know, creating a problem, you know, congestion-wise for vehicles. So far, its distance hasn't hasn't presented a problem in. 16, maybe even more years. Uh, and as Blaine said, like in this case, because of the small area in which we have to build, like every square foot counts. Um, and you know, that was true even before Blaine mentioned the staircase, which is something the layperson, me, the layperson doesn't uh, you know, think of. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, open public hearing. Yes, sir. Hey, thanks. Uh, this is in my district, and uh, I spoke on it uh, when it was here a couple of months ago. Mr. Tom Cash. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Tom Cash, <laughs> councilman for the 18th district. Uh, and I don't mean to, I don't intend to speak to any specific conditions or issues, but I do appreciate staff working with Mr. Stebbins and his wife. Um, I think this is a unique uh, situation where the house, the size of the house, and where the house is. Um, so I'm thankful for staff for working with him, and thankful for the commission for um, looking, at, looking at it in a way that uh, uh, maybe opens up some possibilities for him. Thanks. Thank you, council member. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Martha Stinson. I live at 2606 Westwood Avenue down the street. I would like to encourage this, the commission to consider approving this project. It's a very unique project to the point that you all even had a tie vote on the original uh, proposal 
for the infill in front, it's that unusual. This is a young family just trying to be able to, this guy is just trying to have a house for his family. And um, I'm a neighbor, I'm in favor of it. I would like to encourage you to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Denson. Anyone else? Okay. We will close public hearing. Discussion, commissioners? You wanna start with one item first? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll just go through the one I'm thinking. Um, uh, I mean, the property line, that is a hard one. I mean, while I say, you know, I don't see a problem with it, I do understand the, the usage of the alley and things like that, so if Public Works, I feel like, has said that they don't support it, that is hard for me to say, but personally, as, as far as the looks and the historic nature, I, you know, I, I think it's, I don't have a problem with it, but again, when Public Works says they do, then I think we have to listen to that. Um, item three, I actually think it, I think it looks nice with it being symmetrical, even over the port cochere, the, they wanted to bring it in on the side. I honestly think it looks um, symmetrical. I like the size and scale and shape of it um, with as, as the applicant has sent it in. Um, and then again, it's so far back, so non-visible from the street. I'm also fine with the concession of a, a larger front porch, um, almost as applied for. So those are my thoughts on these. So I tend to basically want to, again, I think, you know, the discussion of the setback, I think is something we're still having, but um, I'm fine with, I would approve taking off items one and three, and then still thinking about item to being the, the setback of the rear property line. One thing, the concern for um, the visibility also is that the possibility of the alley being expanded would be another concern of um, public works. So, you know, we don't know what happens. I mean, it is 16 years from when it's happened that he's owned it. So I think that was the one of the things that public works was concerned about. I agree with everything Commissioner Jones um, has said. This is a very, very unique, unusual lot with the house being set back as far as it is. Um, that, um, And I really want to commend the, the owner and the architect for um, the work that they've done to try to make this addition work with this house and preserving this um, historic home. And so I... Um, I'm okay with the front porch, um, more depth on the front porch. I'm okay with the second story above and behind the border cache, and also okay with the setbacks. Um, I hadn't thought about the public works issue, but I guess before that was mentioned, I was fine with the two foot setback because it is adjacent to an alley. You're not encroaching on anyone else's, um, you know, anyone else's property, and I mean, that is their property line. Um, it is a curbed alley, which does offer more protection than uh, some of the other alleys that you see around town. So I, I'm, I don't know, I take pause with the Metro Public Works comments, but I, I mean, without that, I would actually, um, I would support, support it as designed. Setback discussion. Um, I also talked to Tim Walker about that this morning, and he said that years ago when we were first given, you were first given this ability to determine what the appropriate setbacks should be, that um, Sunny West, who this room is named for, uh, recommended to us that we never approve less than five feet on an alley, off an alley, because alleys aren't always exactly where they're supposed to be, aren't always exactly the width they need to be, and that it would be safest not to approve less than five. So I just wanted to, to provide that for you. I like the pause. Uh, you know, uh, Sonny was 
wonderful and gave incredible guidance in the time that I worked with him and so many others, uh, and I respect that. You know, as part of uh, this commission's work, we see a lot of alleys go by a lot of properties that are on the agenda to come up to, so that we can really get a feel for it. And I do have to say, in driving this alley uh, in preparation for this meeting, uh, it is not nearly as constrained as a lot of other alleys. Uh, it is a m much more open alley than a lot, you know, even with the fences being two feet from there. So as much as I respect that, um, you know, and, and, and I guess one of the other things I have to say too is we're at a l little bit of a disadvantage here because a lot of the plans, we don't review the interiors of these structures, but when we're being asked to determine things like setbacks in this, not knowing what the inside floor plan is, it, it really hinders us from being able to make a decision that is responsible uh, based on the impact of that building. Um, I, I, I do see that, you know, the 15 feet is a, is a very tight for an addition with stair, and since that the stair and vertical circulation does have to be within this two-story structure, uh, th that is a consideration. But um, at, at any rate, I, I think that's open to interpretation. Now, I remember when we heard this last month, we said, uh, gosh, we're going to bend over backwards to try to help you do what you need to to make this your family home. And uh, those probably weren't our exact words, but, but they were very close. And so uh, I think that's what we're being asked to do today. And so. I'd like to add to that. Um, I congratulate the applicant and the staff for working on what, obviously we're trying to find a compromise uh, position here. So I think we're getting there. Um, I agree with the other comments on the setback at the rear. I'm okay with that because I think the family needs that room to, to have livable space. At the same time, I feel like um, this is a small historic home that's a contributing to the district. And there's the, there's the, opportunity to perhaps overwhelm it somewhat. So with, pr with regard to the front proposed porch, um, it is larger than historic porches typically are. Uh, lots of hi historic porches, you cannot put a lot of furniture on them. Um, so I understand, I I'm, I'm with uh, Cyril on per perhaps a, a compromise between what they want and what has been proposed, maybe eight, maybe even 10 feet depth. Uh, and at the same time, I'm in agreement with the staff's recommendation to keep the section behind the portico share uh, at one foot, I mean, excuse me, as, at one story in, um, in keeping with, uh, just trying to keep the house from over, the, the new addition from overwhelming the historic home. So I'm kind of in between where everybody is right now, but I do support in general, the, the plan that the applicant has proposed, with those two exceptions. This is a difficult case, mm -hmm. and this is such a small house, and it's set back so far. Um, I guess my general um, feeling is that, that I don't have a problem with the large porch because it's just so far back. Um, I don't really have a... Uh, I'm a little worried about the setbacks being so close to the alley. Um, and I, 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 I'm gonna have to defer to you all as far as the, the architects, as far as the second story on the, the addition. Um, so that's just where I stand right now. I would say that I do agree with the sentiments that have been shared, that this is a, a reasonable solution to a unique situation, and it will provide overall improvement, of course, to um, just the neighborhood and the, um, the curb appeal as well. In terms of the actual setback, I do agree to make sure that it is modest, and like you said, for future need or expansion or whatnot, I think that is uh, reasonable for consideration. Um, in terms of the front porch, I don't have an issue with that because I believe it is important to have that space essentially because there is no backyard or rear space for that. So I agree with, with most of what has been um, said today and I certainly do appreciate the staff for working with this applicant for this solution as well. We're kind of all over the place on this one. Um, yeah. Make a motion. Someone make a motion or more discussion or, because I, you know, listen to 
listen to consent and as well. So do we want to go through each one or I think you've, okay. So the, the front porch, does I think everyone for the most part is okay with that. I'd, I'd like to ask Commissioner Stewart to ask to, to address that again since you did bring up the compromise what do you do you find that very important or not because um, we're, we're making pretty big concessions yes. elsewhere I, I do think the proportions of it are somewhat important I do think the four to six feet is way too small um, I think that that ten feet would probably be an accept, acceptable compromise a lot closer to what they asked for than, uh, than than what the staff is recommending but I found that to be a, a, a very a reasonable working space within a porch for seating and kids playing and all the activities for a porch. So, so yes, I think I hear 10 foot by five eight ten foot, foot. Okay. 10 foot by eight foot. Zero. I think that's what I heard you say. Yeah, what was the width that they drew? I don't. Well, I was gonna say I think three of us are okay with how it was drawn. Mm -hmm. You need one more. So then, okay. what do we do? <laughs> That's just on one point. Yeah. Um, and I think the applicant had brought forth that yeah. because of such a wide front. I mean, I know we're we're really trying to make this work. Uh, uh, we all get the sense of that. Um, you know, where else are we going to make a concession? If truly that is um, n not imperative to the historical feature, you know, what about that 15 foot or the two foot in the back? Uh, it's, to me, it's, it sounds like it's more, much more important. Um, you know, so number one, let's let's but, skip <laughs> to the next one. Oh, well, but but I think I think. You know, perhaps we could go with 10 feet deep by 15 feet wide, which is close to what they've asked for. Uh, that would uh, that would allow them to have the play space that the owner uh, said is so important for the children. And, uh, and the other thing I think about that front porch is that with the Department of Interior standards, that could be removed in the future and taken back to, to the existing uh, structure. Okay, let's be clear on that. So. The applicant is asking for 10 by 15. Is that what I'm hearing? He asked for 12, 5 by 15, 12, 4 by 15, 1. So okay. I'm just saying 10 by 15. Okay. 10 by 15. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, number two. I think we should stick with the current recommendation of five feet. Commissioner says that she sh that to what we should stick to the five foot. I hear I think two or three of you that are not quite on that same page. Okay. Well, we're, we'll see how we vote Do you know on this. What public works issue was for the. Mind just. Um. So let me just find it. Give me a second while I find it in my notes. Um, well, while she's looking, I'll, I'll add to that again. It, it's, it is a public works issue, um, but it's also an alley width issue where the alley lays. I know that there's one house in particular, it's a different neighborhood, but their garage is very close to an alley. And so the public work uh, trucks often hit it and have caused damage over and over and again. So it's just, you know, sort of best practices to, to keep people safe and to keep the alley safe. And, um, but Melissa may have more specific information. Sure. Um, if I, I can actually find the exact email and, and read it to you. So hold on one second. While she's looking up, I believe the um, justification put in the staff report was safety for visibility, but that I don't really see how that applies because there's already that gate there and you, you but, don't have to see around the house necessarily. But it will be a taller house. It will be a two-story house in the back. Right. Close but to But as an alley. A, a driver down an alley isn't the height of 
you're already you already can't see because of the fence that's going to be even closer to the alley from that. I don't know. I, I don't understand. I don't understand that. Okay. Point. So here's the email from Public Works. Um, uh, MPW Metro Public Works would not be supportive of the two foot. He doesn't say setback, but I'm assuming he means setback. We would want to be able to achieve the Mo Metro Public Works standard ST263 alley section one day. The standard alley section is 20 feet, and I think the two foot setback may interfere with obtaining the 20 foot right of way. I think we could support the five foot setback, which is standard in other areas of town. I mean, I hear that and point taken. Um, I hate to make Rory mad, um, but Don't do that. again, Let's you know, I think, I mean, I, get, I do mad. agree. I mean, I get it, but I, I feel like that's also just kind of a blanket statement. And this alley is a lot different than a lot of alleys in town that are like, you're dodging, you know, and this has a protected curb and there's already been a fence there. So that's just my feeling on it. I mean, if the commissioner's Maybe we could do a, you know, again, at this point without, like, as Commissioner Stewart said, without seeing the, inter the internal, you know, structures. But, again, that's not, I don't think we need to go that far, but it is sometimes helpful. But, you know, you know I'd be okay. You know, three feet if we want to just, so two feet isn't enough. But, you know, five feet is taking off quite a bit of just that, just that teeny, teeny area that they have back there to work with. So, but, again, I, you know, that's just something that I'm off the top of my head because I just feel like this alley is... It's got a protected curb, and yeah, you're um, not. Yeah. Last year, we're, when you drove by there, um, and when you said it was a little bit more different than than the others, what what were you? Um, can we get your perspective, please? Uh, many of the alleys that I drive through, especially East Nashville, North Nashville, other places, you're not sure the car is going to be able to get between the trees and the uh, trash cans and the garages and the driveways and light poles and all that. And this one, the utilities are on the other side of the alley. Um, it, is, it is a pretty clear shot down through there. It's uh, not wiggling, waggling um, past this section. And um, so, so I felt like there was ample room back there. Uh, yeah, I respect Public Works' desire for a 20-foot alley. In reality, that's not going to happen in most places uh, because of the existing structures that are there. So. I'm, I, I do think maybe going to three feet's a good compromise to that. So. Did, did we hear that, that possibly three foot might be the compromise? Okay. okay. All right, uh, number three. I mean, I'll just say what I was um, thinking on this initially. I mean, I, again, it's... No, the house isn't even, you know, visible from the street. I think it adds, and again, you know, I, I agree, Commissioner Price, on you know, not overwhelming the house, but I think it adds a nice symmetry, and and so for me, I, and that's just the fact that it's so far back on the lot. I don't think the visible impact will be high, um, just for that one section. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I like it as uh, applied for. So I personally would strike the whole um, uh, recommendation number three. Can we get that picture back up on the screen, please? Thank you. Uh, Not that one. You, there you go. Yeah. Commissioners, are you settled on that? Okay. You don't, don't have to vote for it, but I personally just am not opposed to the, mm -hmm. the symmetry that it gives. Agreed. I agree okay. with Commissioner Jones. Okay. All right. Uh, I think number four is pretty standard. Number five is standard. Number six is standard. Number seven is standard. So I think we're there. <laughs> And I, I do have to say before we take a vote on this that I, I think that the owner, the architect, this commission has really worked hard to try to find a solution for this. I do think that what we're doing to this historic home is 
you know, I, I would have a trouble calling it contributing once we do this to it. But I think we've sort of forced ourselves into this by saying this is the only house that can be on this lot. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I, whereas I'm okay with moving ahead as we're headed, um, it is unfortunate that this structure be lost uh, to what it, from what it was historically. So. Okay. okay, will somebody make the motion with those uh, conditions? Uh, sure, um, Chair, regarding 2121 Westwood Avenue, I move for approval with, um, with the following uh, changes to the staff summary. Uh, number one, we recommend a, to approve with the condition that the front porch be reduced to 15 feet wide by 10 feet in depth. Number two, the rear addition be no closer than three feet from the rear property line. And number three, the section of the addition behind the port, just striking number three, actually, <laughs> and uh, including numbers four, five, six, and seven. Well done. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? None opposed? The pa passes. All right, the, the next case is for- Ooh, Let's infill. just say that one more time. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, applicant and staff, for working through, and owner on working on this, because it's been a tough one, and it's very, it, it'll be rare, hopefully we won't have to do too many of these, <laughs> but um, we really do appreciate it, so thank you. Okay, so the next case is uh, for infill at 922 Russell Street. Um, this was previously on your agenda in April and uh, the commission did approve a plan um, and this is a, a revised plan that has been um, redesigned somewhat. So the existing house at 922 Russell Street um, was built in the early 1970s and does not contribute to the historic character of the Edgefield neighborhood. Um, staff has issued a preservation permit to demolish the non-contributing house. Uh, the application is to construct detached duplex infill on a 90-foot wide lot. The project includes two single-story outbuildings. Um, as I said before, you've seen this before, the commission did approve a, a, a detached duplex uh, infill with two single-story outbuildings in April, um, which has not been constructed. Um, this is the redesign plan. So here's the streetscape showing um, the revised units A and B. And I'll go through this fairly quickly since we've, we've already established that um, the detached duplex is appropriate on this lot. Um, as proposed, um, both units will be oriented to Russell Street um, and um, meet all setbacks. Vehicular access is from the alley. Uh, as proposed, um, Neither unit is taller or wider um, than what was previously approved, so the height and scale are pretty much the same. This is unit A, um, the front and, and rear elevations. And here are the side elevations. Overall, um, this, this plan is slightly shorter than what was approved in April. And here are the front and rear, front and rear elevations for unit B. Um, also keeping with the height and scale that was approved um, in April, and the side elevations, which are the same depth as, as the previous unit. And here are the outbuildings. Um, they're single story, utilitarian, um, and meet the design guidelines. Here are some photos for context. Um, the photo at the top is the historic house directly to the right of the site. Um, and I believe the photo on the bottom is across the street. Here are some additional historic homes on this block of Russell. A few more. And in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the project um, with um, the following conditions. Um, conditions one and two are both standard conditions, the finished floor height being consistent with historic homes on the block as well as the, the front setback. Uh, three, staff approve all of the unknown materials prior to purchase and installation. Uh, four, staff approve all materials for the outbuildings prior to purchase and installation. Five, staff approve the location of all utilities. And six, since 
this uh, project is in a historic preservation zoning overlay, staff would need to approve the location, design, and materials of any appurtenances, such as fencing, any changes to the existing um, site walls um, prior to those changes being made. So here, if you have any questions. So just the general design change from the last one, just kind of the look of it? Right, yeah, just, the, and since it is a different plan, um, we thought it appropriate to bring it back. But yeah, the height sure. and scale are the same, the roof forms are very similar. Um, staff found it to be appropriate as proposed. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Is the applicant here? <clears throat> Hello again, my name is Blaine Bonadies. Uh, I inherited this project um, that was previously um, previously um, <clears throat> approved. Uh, we made some slight variations because it's a new owner. Um, one of the major uh, variations we made was we took the outdoor space, which was uh, on the side of the building, um, and it was above a conditioned space, and we swung it around to the back, and we put it over top of an unconditioned space. So. Visually, you don't even see it. You see it less. And then the, I think the building shrunk slightly um, doing some of those sort of three-dimensional differences that we made in plan. And we made some different improvements to the plan in terms of what the uh, new owner's programmatic requirements were um, in terms of number of bedrooms and Jack and Jill, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of the floor plan. So some of the fenestrations changed. In general, nothing really is drastically different uh, maybe we shorten the porch ever so slightly so that the eave wouldn't go beyond the bay or something like that. But in terms of uh, the submission, it really 98% of it is still the same. Thank you. Thank you. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Discussion or motion? <laughs> I'll, I'll do a motion to approve the staff recommendations for 922 Russell Street. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. None opposed? Okay. The motion carries. <laughs> Thirteen oh seven Shelby. This is an application for demolition of this contributing building, arguing for economic hardship. The building itself dates uh, into the 1880s. Um, the footprint is largely the same as you can see here in the Hopkins map from um, 1889, I think. Uh, rear porch has been added, had been added, uh, and a side porch between the, uh, the side L's, but largely the, the footprint was the, uh, was the same. Staff issued a permit in May of this year for partial demolition of the non-contributing rear addition and for the, uh, the side porch for the purpose of uh, rebuilding and adding on in the future. The contractor removed those side gabled portions, uh, work which was not permitted. When work was stopped at that point, uh, the owners at that time uh, asked staff about pursuing full demolition of the building, stating that the structural condition precluded further work. The Department of Codes and Safety of the, uh, the arrows are on the rear addition and the, the L's that were removed previously. Um, uh, the Codes Department uh, contacted the previous owners shortly after they purchased it in July uh, about several property standards violations and ordering the demolition of the building. The engineer's report on the structure observes that the structural systems are significantly deteriorated and were inadequately designed and built to begin with. Uh, the load-bearing systems have been damaged um, by water and termites. The contractors began building new piers, some of which you can see, I think, in, um, in one of those pictures, uh, until they determined that the extent of the damage to the structure uh, was too far gone. The engineer affirms in his report that the building should be demolished. Staff inspected the building twice. Our inspections confirmed the condition of the structure uh, it is staff's review that the building has suffered from deferred maintenance and poor construction of the structural elements. The building uh, was gutted earlier this year as part of the partial demolition, leaving it mostly a, a shell, so there are no original features remaining on the interior. 
more pictures of the, the structural elements. Using the estimates supplied by the applicant, staff estimated the fair market value of the building if it were uh, rehabilitated, uh, adjusting the estimates for items that may have been overestimated or not required for our scope of review as we usually do, um, but the range of expenditures represents a, a loss in any case. The condition of the building, the amount of demolition um, that has already taken place and the amount of replacement materials that would be required would result in a building that has um, lost its integrity. Staff therefore recommends approval of the application, finding that the cost of necessary repairs exceeds the value of the home um, and that the proposed demolition meets section 3B2 for appropriate demolition. Thanks, Paul. Questions? I think applicants Paul, are here. Yes. Paul. Mm -hmm. Um, would, do we have any idea of plans to replace this building? Not at this time. But we would approve that? That's correct. Like as what? what, what? No, it'll have to meet the yeah, it would have to meet the guideline. I'll, I'll save it for my discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, is the applicant here? Please. Please come forward, if you'd like. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Deirdre Kerr. I'm actually representing them. They're out of town right now. I'm the realtor who helped them purchase from the previous owner who had started a renovation and then realized that it wasn't feasible. Is there anything else you, you'd need to know? No? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Open public hearing. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, just want to uh, say that obviously we always hate to lose our really, really old uh, historic structures in East Nashville. Um, this one obviously is in bad shape. Um, the property has been in a poor state of repair for a long time. Um, as the uh, staff alluded to, even before even before I think the prior owners owned it, it, it had not been well maintained for a long time. So we were all hoping that it could be salvaged somehow. We knew it's a small house, it would take a pretty large addition uh, in the rear to make that economically viable, but it's just unfortunate that it's gotten to the state that it's in, which is no fault of the present owners. Um, so I've um, run that information by the East End Neighborhood Association representatives, and they understand the um, circumstances and the hardship, and they're uh, familiar with building themselves, so they uh, they understand that um, and generally agree with the, the staff recommendation to approve uh, the demolition in this case. One thing I may, and I'm not sure I'll be able to stay quite as long as, as I might like, but um, this is, is uh, not the first uh, example that I've seen where removal of siding and materials from houses that doesn't nor or ordinarily require a permit um, more or less leads to demolition. Um, so that is one of the factors in the design gu guidelines consolidation that is being addressed to sort of beef up that protection a little bit, but this is not the first case that I've seen where removing uh, sometimes even just a lot of the exterior materials from buildings which doesn't require a permit necessarily, um, more or less leads to the failure of the structure. Um, so I uh, just want everyone to keep that in mind as, as, as a positive aspect of the design guidelines consolidation project. But, but otherwise, I do appreciate the applicants themselves or the representative reaching out to me and letting me know what's going on. And that gave me an opportunity to present that to the East End Neighborhood Association Board. And uh, there are no objections from the East End Neighborhood Association Board to this demolition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Close public hearing. Discussion. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's it's unfortunate that this house has has reached this state. I, um, one of the things in reading through the materials that I think is important to note is that the current owners were not responsible for this. They just purchased it in October. October and are actually neighbors behind the property. Um, correct me if I'm wrong in any of that. Um, they're neighbors behind the property and we're, we're actually concerned, it said in the letter, about 
um, a two-story garage being built there or something. There, they. It sounds like the intent um, from their perspective is that they were, if it is to be replaced, they would actually prefer it to be modest because they are backyard neighbors to this property. So I just wanted to make that point clear that they were, they are new owners and were responsible for this. Yeah, I completely agree with Councilman Withers in that uh, this is an example of a contractor and former owner who went bananas on this house. And a lot of the structural issues with it are very common in East Nashville and all of, a lot of our in-town neighborhoods and can be dealt with as long as you don't make it even worse through partial demolition. Um, I wish we had a mechanism to pull the former owner in to account for herself and what she's done to this house, but of course we can't do that. Um, that said, I, I also agree that um, being familiar with the current owners and their intent, I have, I'm have, i hopeful and that they're gonna replace this with a very nice, modest house uh, that will fit in with the design guidelines. Um, so that's it. Anyone else? Yeah, we have had discussions about demolition by neglect and we hope that we don't have too many of those, but hopefully the public is hearing <laughs> to try to maintain your historic structures. Okay, is there a motion or more discussion? Lamenting? On, <laughs> I'll try and keep my venting to myself. Uh, on 1307 Shelby Avenue, I move that we approve. Motion? Second. Second, all in favor? Are there any opposed? None. The motion carries. <laughs> bye bye, House. Uh, this next application is to construct a, an outbuilding at 2516 Belmont Boulevard. Uh, the outbuilding will be in the rear yard. It will be a two-story outbuilding with a hipped roof. <laughs> it meets the design guidelines, as you've seen in your recommendations. It meets the guidelines for height and scale and materials. Uh, it will be located, as I said, in the rear yard behind the house. Uh, it will be 20 feet from the back of the house, which meets the guidelines. Uh, it will be five feet off well, let's do the site plan. Five feet off the rear alley, which also meets the guidelines. Uh, it is proposed to be five feet from the right side property line, which is the south and the bottom of uh, the image there. Um, uh, as five, proposed to be five feet from that property line. Uh, from a, a street side setback for an outbuilding uh, is required under standard bulk zoning regulations to be 10 feet. Um, as you know, the commission has the authority to approve uh, shorter setbacks or reduce setbacks uh, and have done so on a number of occasions, including earlier today. Uh, and this is another instance where the Public Works Department has advised maintaining the current setback uh, because, uh, quote, five foot setbacks can cause sight distance issue for the motorist seeing around the structure. Uh, and that would be from that, that entering and exiting the alley there. Uh, so with a 10 foot setback, uh, uh, Public Works Department would uh, not have that con same concern. Again, so that would be, um, they're proposing a five foot setback from the Sweetbriar Avenue property line. Uh, Public Works advises against that five foot setback. And staff recommends approval of uh, the proposed outbuilding uh, with conditions that staff shall approve brick window and door selections prior to purchase and installation. And that the right side setback along Sweetbriar Avenue shall be a minimum of 10 feet. And with those conditions, staff finds that this outbuilding meets the Belmont Hillsboro design guidelines. Thank you, Sean. Sean, is the setback along Sweetbriar um, ten feet? Is looks like it's about where the house, what the house setback is. 
Uh, I believe that's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. If you have no other questions for me, there is okay. an applicant here. All right, applicant. Blaine Bonadis, 1606 Linden Avenue. Uh, I live in this neighborhood, I live quite close to this house actually. Um, I did the renovation addition to it maybe five, seven years ago. Um, I'm batting a thousand, so I'm, I'm counting on you guys. Um, <clears throat> to answer the first concern about public works in terms of sight lines, if we build this building five foot off of the sidewalk, uh, we would actually be sort of in, being improving the visual around that corner because that fence would be going away. I realize that fences are something that come and go, but in terms of creating a mulch strip along <laughs> Sweet Briar with a, a three foot retaining wall, which abuts the sidewalk, and then five feet, which is a perfect um, buffer, uh, landscape buffer for trees or some bushes or something like that, and then the building I think is an appropriate distance from the sidewalk. If it's 10 feet, it almost sort of becomes this kind of no man's land, implicates the side yard pretty, pretty significantly in terms of that five additional feet, which is what's left back there. Um, let me see if I can get through my notes here. Um, I do have some examples um, uh, that have been approved um, as of recent. And I think that I would probably wear this clicker out if I showed you all the examples, uh, limited to three, which are literally within spitting distance of our project. So um, I think that it is certainly um, something that's been precedented. And, and you can see about that five foot strip there that I'm talking about, which becomes this kind of perfect landscaping situation. A little history, we met with staff uh, initially and wanted the owner wanted to put the building um, facing or the access for the cars facing uh, Sweetbriar. Um, and so what that enabled us to do actually was to bring the building down to grade, which would have dropped the building about three feet or so um, in terms of its height. Um, but we talked with staff, staff said, you know, what we would rather it face the alley um, and um, we have no issue with the five feet. We went ahead with it, we designed it, sold it to the client, talked him into this new situation where we're gonna now enter, enter from the alley. They were okay with that. We submitted, we came, there, were, there was responses back to us saying that we talked to Public Works, Public Works would rather have a 10 foot setback. Um, my response to that is that telephone pole that you see there, in addition to the other telephone poles along Sweetbriar are, are what Public Works um, positions. And we have two in the rear of our lot um, we would not be implicating either of those. And in terms of just squeezing this thing in, um, those poles are positioned ever so perfectly for us to keep that five foot setback on the side, come off the alley as we've been requested. And so um, I, would, I would ask of you um, to make an exception to that. Um, I, I believe that um, you know, uh, zoning are the ones that are in charge of making those setback requirements on the property. Um, Public Works, I understand, works within the right of way, but I think these examples show you uh, pretty clearly um, and have been approved as of recent um, that they work and they're fine and they are also um, historically correct. I think if you look at some of the Sanborn maps, particularly along that alley, all of those buildings are kind of shoved to the you know, rear of the property and off, off to the side. So I don't think it's out of character in terms of what we're asking um, architecturally. And I think the streetscape, um, do I have, how do I get back to the, to the submission? Yes, 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 please. Can you go another one to the street, street, that, that's the streetscape. Uh, one more, the, the drawing of Sweet Bar. There you go, back one, there you go. So uh, what you can see there is um, <clears throat> we've raised the building a little bit, which is not necessarily preferable 
um, from an architectural standpoint because it does kind of make that building taller. But again, that was asked of us to enter off the alley, which is a much higher grade. We do have a three foot, which you cannot see it behind this fence in the lower slide. We have a three foot retaining wall that continues along there. And there are, uh, I guess, stanchions that hold these poles up that come to the edge of the sidewalk. So five feet beyond that, I think, is plenty of room to operate in terms of being able to maintain that pole or do whatever you need to do within the right of way. So I don't think that it is that big of an imposition. Um, I think it architecturally it looks better. Um, I think that, um, you know, I've been in situations where outbuildings have been granted a three foot setback in the side and a five foot setback in the, in the rear. So again, what we're asking for, I think, is not out of the ordinary. And I think it'll make a huge difference to the client in terms of maintaining that backyard. And there is a swing set that if we do push this building another five feet, it's gonna implicate that play area. It, the building that we're proposing is sort of shoved over towards the street that enables this back porch to look out over that green space. So it is critical um, when you're sitting on that back porch to not have that um, building in the back, um, you know, implicate that view of the back and give that sort of sense of space and not to mention just to be able to see, you know, the, the kids and everybody else playing back there. So thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. Open public hearing. Uh, I just... Uh I'd like to maybe correct something. I think the applicant mischaracterized something I said in our conversation when we met. Um, I certainly did not say that we were okay with a five foot setback from the street. Uh, I said that I would check with sub public works to see what they advised because the standard setback under bulk <laughs> zoning regulations, which uh, this commission has the, the authority to override the standard setback for uh, an outbuilding face with garage doors facing the street, that setback is 20 under the bulk zoning regulations. And also it's so close to an alley, that's another thing that Public Works doesn't like penetrations from the right of way within such a short distance between each other, uh, be between the two. Uh, and the standard setback under bulk zoning regulations from the alley for garage doors that face an alley is 10 feet. So that's something that the commission has the authority to override and, and staff is supportive of that. Um, it, uh, so I said I would check with Public Works to see what that setback off of Sweet Briar is, uh, which it is 10 feet and which Public Works advises against reducing that setback because it is a site distance issue, again, a safety concern, vehicles entering and exiting the alley uh, from, or from the alley in Sweet Briar Avenue. Sean, may I ask you a question? Um, I guess two questions. I don't know, I'd love to know the history of our bulk zoning standards. Are they built, or were they designed for suburban development where you have lots of room to place? Do you happen to know to place buildings? I, mean, uh, I, I just, I feel like these, we, yeah. we keep bumping up because well, we're in historic districts versus I think the bulk if you were in, in um, Bellevue or something, it might not be an issue. Well, I think the bulk zoning regulations were sort of written one size fits off. And, and, and that's why this commission was given the authority to determine so it setbacks to be appropriate for the, based on the historic context. Uh, because historic houses don't always follow the one size fits all chart. Um, and then as the applicant shows, you have historic examples sure. uh, where outbuildings are, uh, are closer or less than yeah, I, th I think it's fair to say we see them all the time. I see them all the time. Um, we certainly do. This uh, 2601 Belmont is a, a setback uh, that the, this commission approved five feet off of the property line. That is one where the commission, where the Public Works Department said, please don't do that anymore. So that's mm -hmm. part of aware our awareness to that. Uh, 2227 Belmont Avenue, uh, that was an existing outbuilding uh, that uh, did not have uh, garage doors facing the street. They wanted to add on a bicycle shop or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that looks like a garage door, but they signed an affidavit saying that it would not be used for a motor vehicle. And as mm -hmm. you can see, there's no curb cut leading to that right. garage door. Uh, would you back up to the to the photo showing the rear sort of oblique view of the of the property with the with its fence? That one. 
No, uh, the, the oh, current the, property we're talking the, about. So, yeah. yeah. That one. And when we're talking about site distance and safety for entering and exiting, the, what I don't get is that fence there is already blocking car, car view. It is, and actually the public works, uh, the, there's a setback requirement for fences that fences also be 10 feet off the public right of way. Mm -hmm. Nobody uh, enforces that and it would be, the manpower would be just impossible right. for, for, for them to keep okay. up with. But, uh, and that situation's also exacerbated that you don't have to have a permit to build a fence, but you can build a fence that's non-compliant with the codes, which this one is. <laughs> so it's, yeah. Well, thank you, Sean. Continued discussion. Yep. I thought I closed. Did I open? Did I already close public hearing or not? No. Okay. Open public hearing. <laughs> We're such in discussion. We sometimes miss that. Hi, my name is Lindsay Moffat. I'm with Belmont Hillsborough Neighbors Association. Um, I'm glad you said the fence was non-compliant because it should be 50% open if it's at that height or, the, or that uh, distance from the alley. I happen to live uh, on Belmont, so I come down this alley quite a bit. The issue we're having in the neighborhood is line of sight for pedestrians, people who are walking their dogs, people who are pushing strollers. So if you can imagine if you're where that car is and you're headed toward 12 South and you're pushing a baby stroller, and you hit that fence and a car is coming down the alley, they're gonna surge out so they can see beyond the fence and they may hit your baby carriage or your dog. Um, we have these little issues all over the neighborhood and we're trying to mitigate th the safety issues that it's causing for the pedestrians. Th these areas are walkable. I mean, it's amazing the foot traffic because of 12 South, because of Airbnb, because of all the young families that have moved into the neighborhood. So we really need to work a little bit harder on making it safer for pedestrians. And this is one issue that we'd like to see addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Anyone else? Okay, close public hearing. I think with respect to the setback, um, you know, this is not a convenience issue. It, it, as, as the uh, public's just stated, you know, it is a safety issue. And I think Public Works has stated it's a safety issue. I, I know in our neighborhood, it's the same issue that we have, uh, you know, with, uh, when you're pulling out Belmont Boulevard, it's a hard street to pull out onto. And between parallel parking and fences and landscaping, uh, it's easy to not be able to see cars and pedestrians coming. So uh, I would support the staff recommendation uh, for the 10 foot setback. Any other comments? Was that a motion? <laughs> yep. uh, I, I'm in agreement, okay. so I'll just go ahead. And uh, with right. regard to uh, 2516 Belmont Boulevard, I move for approval with staff recommendations. There's a motion. Second. All in favor? None opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. Two fifty Harding Place is an application for infill and an outbuilding on this vacant lot in the Belmead Links Triangle Conservation Zoning Overlay. The new building has side setbacks of five feet and fourteen feet. The front setback splits the uh, the difference of the neighboring buildings, which is about a foot in difference. The rear of the building would be fifty-five feet from the rear property line, therefore meeting all base zoning requirements and Section Two B C of the design guidelines for setbacks and rhythm of, scape, of spacing. The house is one and a half stories, as you can see here, similar to the neighboring homes with a ridge height of 27 feet, six inches. The eave height will be 12 feet and the foundation height two feet, which are in keeping with the range of the context. The width is 41 feet, also in the range of other residences uh, on Harding Place. The height and scale are compatible and staff finds that they meet sections 2B1A and B for the height and scale. 
the uh, brick is the primary cladding with a secondary cladding, fiber cement and cedar in the gables. Staff finds that the materials meet uh, the section of the guidelines for uh, materials. Staff recommends having final approval of a masonry sample, roofing color, windows and doors, and the driveways and walkways. The new building meets the guidelines for orientation, proportion and rhythm of openings. There is a um, 615 square feet outbuilding proposed. Uh, the outbuilding is 20 feet tall, nine foot eaves. Uh, setbacks of three feet and five feet with 21 feet between the outbuilding and the residence with similar materials to the main building. So the outbuilding also meets the design guidelines. In conclusion, here are context photos. In conclusion, staff recommends approval with the conditions that the finished floor height is consistent with those of nearby historic homes, staff approval of materials, and that HVAC and other utilities are located for minimal visibility. Questions to Paul? All right. Thank you, Paul. Is the applicant here? Uh, Chris Goldbeck with Pichet Design, and I just want to thank the staff for working with us on this application, and we find their recommendations to be favorable and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, any questions? All right, thank you. Open public hearing, close public hearing. Discussion or motion? I think this, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> I found this uh, um, Proposal fairly straightforward, and uh, unless there's any discussion, was going to make a motion for approval. Um, with respect to the property at 250 Harding Place, um, I'd like to make a motion to approve staff recommendations. Second. Motion and a second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed. The motion passes. Do you hope you can keep some of those trees. <laughs> All right. seeing if the applicant was still here. Uh, 1812 Fifth Avenue North, and this is an application for new construction and infill and outbuildings. Uh, the infill will be a duplex. It will be a uh, two-story side-by-side duplex with a hipped roof. It uh, will be 35 feet tall or just under 35 feet tall. Salem Town guidelines are specific in that they allow two stories and buildings to be up to 35 feet tall, so it meets that guideline, or those guidelines. The width is 34 feet wide in the front, uh, and then after 14 feet expands to be 36 feet wide. Um, this is an appropriate width for Salem Town. Um, uh, there's the other side. Um, in fact, a similar design has been constructed over on, oh, they're the outbuildings. Uh, outbuildings uh, total is under, total footprint combined is under 750 square feet. And uh, the height and scale materials are appropriate. Uh, as I was starting to say, the, similar to a design that was approved, uh, this is across the street. Um, um, different ports, some different window configuration, but it's roughly the same massing. Uh, and if you want to know what it looks like in white, uh, there it is over on 4th Avenue. Um, and of course, it was historically very common for builders or uh, developers to build from plan books, so you would find similar houses uh, throughout a neighborhood uh, quite frequently. Staff recommends approval of the uh, proposed infill and outbuildings with conditions that the floor height is consistent with floor heights of neighboring historic houses. The staff shall approve the front setback uh, in the field. The staff shall approve masonry samples. Staff shall approve roof color, windows, doors, trim, porch floors, porch stairs, porch railings, and paving materials. And uh, the staff shall approve the window and door selections and roof colors. And meeting all those conditions, staff finds this project meets the, the design guidelines for the Salem Town Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Questions? 
None. Okay. Applicant. Yes, again, I'm Preston Quirk, architect for this project, and I'll just be brief. We're in agreement with the staff conditions and appreciate Sean's help and the rest of the staff with this. So, thank you. Thank you, applicant. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Discuss our motion. As with the last uh, project, this is also very straightforward and seems uh, in keeping with our, what's already happening in Salem Town. I move for approval of 1812 Fifth Avenue North with staff uh, conditions. There's a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? None opposed. The motion passes. All right. The, the next item on the agenda is for 300 Broadway. Unfortunately, I don't have a presentation for it. Um, we're not able to access the server or internet. But we do have a picture of the sign on the consent agenda. So um, go right back to the beginning. Uh, well, at this point, it's, it's pretty straightforward as well. What? Oh, that's OK. Ah, all right. So. The sign that is proposed is at the top of your screen here. Um, so the application is to install a projecting sign on the... Okay. So it would be on the Third Avenue um, facade of the, the historic building at 300 Broadway. Um, the proposed sign meets the design guidelines for allotment, size, location, illumination materials. There's an existing projecting sign at the location for the proposed sign that will be removed. Uh, the reason that this is on the agenda is because it includes a modification re request for a, a blinking element, uh, which is required to come before the commission for approval. Um, so the projecting sign incorporates the, a blinking element on the eye at the top of the, the sign. Uh, staff finds that this element is uh, a minimal part of the sign and therefore appropriate. In addition, the commission has, um, has fairly regularly approved this sort of modification for signs um, along, along Broadway. Um, the, the blinking element is proposed to occur every second. Uh, the design guidelines allows for blinking lights as a modification, but stipulates that the blink or flash should not be less than every three seconds. Um, so with the condition that, um, that there be at least three seconds between the blinking, um, staff finds that the modification for this element could be appropriate. So staff recommends approval of the signage, including the modification, um, with three conditions. One, that there be at least three seconds between the blinking lights. Two, that the existing projecting sign on the Third Avenue facade be removed prior to the sign being installed. And three, staff inspect the new sign prior to installation, which is a, a standard um, condition for, for all signs. So with those, staff finds that the projecting sign to be appropriate and meet the signage uh, guidelines for the historic or for the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. I'm happy to answer questions, and the applicant is here. The applicant is here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please come forward. Hi, I'm Emily Kuykendall. Nice to meet y'all. My first time. Um, I'm in compliance. Is If there's anything, any questions you have for me? I agree with everything. Okay. So. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Shaw Flip, and I'm with Ryman Hospitality, uh, owner's representative and project manager on the Old Red project. Um, the sign that we're proposing to you guys today is actually replacing an existing projecting sign that's on Third Avenue. We have... Um, recently revamped and reconcepted our rooftop at Old Red with uh, decor and menu changes and that type of thing. And this includes our new logo. So that's basically why we're changing it. Okay. Any questions? Not at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. 
open public hearing, close public hearing. Where is Susan? <laughs> we need a little bit of legal counsel here. That's right. Okay. So um, my my question was that I believe we've we have reviewed um, 300 Broadway under a different um, project, which is the we've seen this many times, and I just wanted to be sure there wasn't any kind of um, it wouldn't impact the the 300 Broadway that is I think still under litigation. The two are separate issues. Um, that was building illumination, and the lower courts um, upheld your decision. They may or may not appeal or may have already. I haven't talked to Metro Legal. Um, and this is replacement signage. Okay. Just wanted our commission to be clear on the difference. And um, yeah, that there wasn't anything that would hinder or, um, you know, the, the process for that. Certainly not an attorney, but they're two different requests. Sure. Okay. Duly noted. Okay. Um, any other discussion on this particular signage? Well, I just want to tell you thank you all for coming and, and looking forward to seeing that new rooftop. And and uh, it's a great project. And so uh, does anybody else have any discussion? All right. So uh, with regard to 300 Broadway, I want to approve the staff recommendations. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. There's none opposed, so the motion passes. Thank you very much. We're assuming those of you that are here would like to listen about the design guidelines, right? Okay. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> and I think Robin's got some preamble to this. Thank you for your patience. I had some computer issues there at the last second. So the Historic Zoning Commission received funding from the Tennessee Historical Commission for design guideline consolidation project. The project began in January 2019 and the grant period ended on September 30th, 2019. And a draft came to the commission on September 18th and was deferred until today. The staff report available online uh, and the Nashville Gov website, Nashville.gov website provides more in-depth information about the project and the process for anyone that may be unfamiliar with it. Previous meetings where introductory information was given are also available on YouTube, as all, are all of your meetings. The project was first presented to the commission in three parts. Part one was the consolidation of all the neighborhood conservation design guidelines into one universal set of design guidelines with part two being individual chapters for each district. All the neighborhood conservation design guidelines are already very similar, but the consolidation provides an opportunity to reorganize and add clarifying language and address some of those things that weren't contemplated when the guidelines were first written. The third component was to create new design guidelines in a plan book for outbuildings, with the idea of providing, again, more flexibility in terms of size and design and clearer guidance. Staff now recommends that part three and any references to part three, again, that's the plan book, be removed from consideration and that parts one and two be reviewed section by section between now and March 2020. So that would be deferring your decision overall until March 2020. We recommend that on December 18th, you could discuss part one, sections two, uh, section three for demolition, section four for materials. And then in January, you could discuss sections five, new construction infill and new construction additions. And then in, on, in February, part one, section seven. And then after we have all of your comments and continued public hearing, uh, the staff could make a revision to the draft from September 13th and bring that to you. And I wanna take this opportunity, if I could, to really thank all the neighborhoods and the council members, they have been a vital, vital part of this since February and are still willing to work with us. They're not burned out yet, or maybe they are, but they're still willing to have more meetings and more discussions. 
we're very, very appreciative of that. So this schedule will allow the commission and staff to ability, again, to continue to accept public comment. So that leaves us, if you end up agreeing on that deferral, uh, with s several sections that could be discussed today. Now, again, we're breaking up these sections for your discussion so that they are a little bit easier to handle, but I'd certainly advise you to be open to any part of the guidelines the public might want to discuss at any time. So and may be able to come to one meeting and not another, and so they may want that opportunity, as I'm sure you would anyway. So looking at part one, section one, introduction, what we're recommending here in that September draft um, is a change to the Secretary of Interior Standards because the Park Service updated the language a little bit. I don't think it really changes the standards, it's just a revised language. That's italicized, so that's information we can update anyway. But we also recommended that, I'm behind the times here. But we also recommended adding some additional clarifying language about the role of the Secretary of Interior Standards in your design review process. This essentially explaining that the code um, requires that the guidelines be based on the standards and that they are your backup if for some reason the guidelines are unclear or there's something that uh, d the guidelines don't d directly address, you've got this sort of spine uh, information to back, up, back you up, back up your decisions. Part one, section eight is relocation. This language was exactly the same in all of the existing guidelines, and we're not proposing any revisions, so we've not received any public comment yet on that section. Section nine is, are the definitions, and again, all the guidelines are a little bit different, so there's more uh, additions to some than others. Uh, we're recommending some of the language change to be clear. We're recommending adding some definitions, I think there may have even been one or two that was deleted because that language does, isn't in the guidelines. But today we're also recommending adding another, which is a definition for rooftop deck because there was some confusion between upper level porches and rooftop decks, things that are actually on the rooftop. So we thought that might be helpful. Part two, staff has not received any um, really any comments or any concerns yet on part two. In September, we gave you a list of the changes for those specific districts. Um, for instance, Cherokee Park, their current guidelines require that infill be all brick, and they asked for that also to include stone. That's probably the most significant change. The others are just italicized information, I think, for the most part. And then part three is recommended for removal uh, for several reasons. The recommended changes were a major departure to how the commission has reviewed outbuildings in several ways, but mainly in that they would allow for outbuildings to be larger scale than the primary building in some cases. Um, staff is not convinced that this is the best direction for the guidelines, and we have received public comment, council member comment, commissioner comments to that effect as well. In addition, not all of the forms may be appropriate for every district or lot. Also, that's some of the public comment we've received. Any changes to the form book would likely not be small tweaks, which is why we're just recommending taking it out altogether. Uh, because a plan book is based heavily on drawings, obviously, rather than text. So further changes are likely to be beyond the expertise of staff. The skill of a designer architect is really needed to provide not only drawings, but real world recommendations on what you know, reasonable uh, dimensions would be so that we can accommodate, or the buildings can accommodate things like modern vehicles and stairs. There's no funding available to hire a consultant to create a revision. The contract with Smith G Studio and uh, the Nashville Civic Design Center, the consultants who created the first draft, their, their contract is complete. They have graciously volunteered to continue to work with us on some tweaks, but we feel like that's not where we are. It'd probably be an overhaul, so we'd really need to hire them again or hire someone else again, and that funding is not available. So in short, this is the schedule we recommend along with those sections that you know, we could talk about today. Again, public can talk about anything they might like. And so we recommend um, deferral with taking in December 18th, part sections uh, two, three, and four from part one. And then in January, sections five and six from part one. And then in February, part one, section seven, 
with the idea of in March having a revised draft. Any questions for me? No, and I would just like to state, uh, yes, absolutely, the neighborhood stakeholders, keeping your neighborhoods informed, attending the meetings, being you know active and vocal participants. I think we all, you know, everyone here um, is super appreciative of that. And then secondarily, to Robin and the staff for doing the same thing, um, continuing to work with the neighborhoods. I mean, um, this is such a large thing to grapple. So I think you know, even you know, for us as a commission, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm trying, you know, reading all the stuff and you know, everything. So just the the detail that you've put into it, you know, the new grid of outlining the changes, which I thought would be something impossible to do, you know, but really going through and giving the details so that the communities are informed and then. Secondarily, that the communities can, you know, the, the stakeholders can inform their neighborhoods, make sure everyone's comfortable with it, and that it's good, and make changes as necessary as we go along this this project. So, I just would like to say thank you to everyone involved because it's been a lot, a lot, a lot, like a very, very, very large undertaking for everyone. And, and I will add to that, if I could, just for whoever may be listening, we are available to come to any neighborhood to talk about this project or any any other project at any time. Uh, we've already set up a number of community meetings which have passed. That was what we were doing in this two months deferral. Um, but however, Belmont Hillsboro invited us to come to their meeting. Richland West End invited us to their meeting. That's coming up. Um, Hillsboro West End invited us to their meeting. You could see from some of the public comment, one of the emails from Council Member, um, uh, Berkeley, Council Member Allen uh, was that they were gonna look at maybe some more meetings for Hillsboro West End, which I appreciate. So we are available, anyone who still has some concerns, still has questions, we can come in and, and help with that in any format that works for them. Thank yeah, you. I just wanted to add too that I, I, I like this schedule and being able to break it down into manageable chunks so that we can have a focus of discussion among the commissioners and um, I think this just seems like a great way for us to be able to, to break this down and, and have a focus at each meeting moving towards March. So thanks. And for the plan build, the outbook plan building, you know, the plan outbuilding plan book, yikes. Um, I mean, Commissioner Rosen's not here. He's an architect. I think he's maybe being voluntold to help out. <laughs> Sounds like a great job for him <laughs> on a volunteer basis. Kids too, kids too. Yeah, right. All so, kids too. Yeah. Look at this dream team. <laughs> we have a we have a dream team. Um, so I think we have to um, approve the proposal for this. Um, not for say that, yeah. This is the deferral and the. Well, I'd recommend taking public comment first. You want to do and that? And then voting okay. on whether or not you want to defer. Okay. We we've kept public. Uh, public hearing open, so it's not closed and won't be until, you know, March. Um, so we will now open public hearing. Uh, reopen, <laughs> continuing. Good afternoon. My name is Martha Stinson, and I am president of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Association. I live at 2606 Westwood Avenue. Thank you for letting me speak. On November the 4th, the Board of Directors of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Association voted to disapprove the Consolidated Guidelines Project. The vote was unanimous with the exception of one abstention, and the vote occurred after months of public participation, a lot of study, and extens extensive uh, discussion. The board understands the reasoning behind the consolidation and the plan book, but where we started to have problems was when changes, revisions, and new rules entered into the picture. This then became for the board a very different project from the stated intent, or as we understood it, or as it was stated on the website, to reorganize and add clarifying language. To us, adding clarifying language and reorganizing does not mean changing the guidelines or revising them or adding new guidelines. So these, these are the questions we asked ourselves and these are the questions I would like to pose to you. Aside from the consolidation and the new plan book, 
What is the overall impact of the changes being proposed? What is the individual impact on any given project for any given property owner? If this passes, what can a property owner do today with their property that they won't be able to do tomorrow? If the board endorses this, how will we explain our support to the property owner whose plans must now be modified, made smaller, fit a new formula, go through extra hoops to replace the siding, and so forth? Respectfully, remember, we already accepted the trade-off of lots of flexibility in exchange for the rules of conservation. And we are thankful to you, the commission, and to the staff for that because we are convinced that it has literally saved our neighborhood. But to use the consolidation project as an opportunity to apply more rules, and a lot more rules, is a move the board simply was not comfortable with. Therefore, the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Association voted not to endorse the project as in its current iteration. So whether the project is voted on in whole today or in pieces over the course of a few months, that stance holds. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Tissell. Uh, I'm a resident of the um, Hillsborough West End uh, neighborhood. I live at 405 Fairfax Avenue. I'm also a member of the Stakeholders Committee and have been involved um, in conservation zoning in our district since it was implemented in uh, 2005. Um, when new conservation zoning districts have been established, um, the Historic Commission and the staff have wisely followed a policy of requiring each interested neighborhood or district to organize and to demonstrate that there is overwhelming support among neighbors for conservation zoning. Um, this sort of bottom-up neighbor-led neighbor process has been successful because it involves residents in the decision-making process and it ensures that conservation zoning is not being imposed on a neighborhood against the will of a majority of its residents. Um, the process of revising and consolidating guidelines that we are discussing here today should follow this same model. So far, unfortunately, it has not. Rather than requiring overwhelming neighborhood support before it is implemented, the impression is that only overwhelming opposition is going to stop it from happening. I am not aware of any neighborhoods that have given their enthusiastic to support to the proposed changes. Um, at least two districts, Hillsborough West End and Belmont Hillsboro, have issued formal statements in opposition to the project. This effort is well-intentioned. Um, I believe the staff have the best interests of our historic neighborhoods at heart. Uh, some of the changes proposed to the guidelines may be a good idea, um, and certainly having one set of guidelines would make the work of the commission and the work of the staff more efficient. So I support the process of researching and proposing changes to the guidelines, but implementation should be done on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis and only for those neighborhoods that will organize and demonstrate support for the changes, not just apathy or indifference, but actual support. And each neighborhood should continue to have its own set of guidelines. Implicit in all this discussion is that there's gonna be one new universal set of guidelines. I believe if we keep our own set of guidelines, they may be very similar, especially if several neighborhoods adopt the proposed changes, or they may become more different than they are now if some neighborhoods adopt them and some don't. Um, that would not be efficient, but efficiency is not the purpose of conservation zoning. Our historic neighborhoods and their residents are diverse. Time. Could I please continue? We'll have more open hearing if you want to come back again. My Mr. name is Lindsay Moffat. I'm past president of Belmont Hillsboro Neighbors. I'm currently chair of the Code Zoning and Conservation Overlay Committee, uh, and I'm a member of the stakeholder um, group that worked on this project. On November 11th, um, the BHN Steering Committee voted unanimously to 
reject the proposed conservation overlay consolidated guideline and plan book for the following reasons. We are just not comfortable with the number of changes that the, that's occurring under these, these changes. Um, there are unforeseen or unknown consequences due to the significant number of guideline changes. An argument could be made uh, that these new restrictions represent taking away property rights without due process. For example, disallowing a ridge raise and a 50, lar 50 percent larger addition, uh, which under these guidelines would no longer be allowed together. This would particularly impact older one and a half story homes who could not realize the same value that they could under today's guidelines. BHM believes in the uniqueness of Nashville's neighborhoods and that should be supported. Consolidating the guidelines in such a way as to preclude the application of the guidelines to individual situations with res within respective neighborhoods does not support this ideal. The current process works. To me and to our neighborhood, it is overreaching to require new restrictions and conditions that would add additional expenses for property owners and take away appreciated value by limiting what can currently be built. Therefore, we respectfully request disapproval of the, pro of the pro proposed guidelines and the plan book. Thank you. Also, you're welcome to send your comments to the staff and we'll continue to read them. Um, you know, we, we continue to open public hearings, so you'll continue to be able to, to voice your concerns. Hi, my name is Jessica McDuffie Massey. I live on 2614 West Linden Avenue. I am a board member of Hillsborough West End Neighborhood and soon to be the 2020 president of our Neighborhood Association. I'm going to finish my fellow board member John Tissell's comments. Our historic neighborhoods and their residents are diverse. A universal set of guidelines does not acknowledge or accommodate that diversity. We are better served by individual sets of guidelines that empower each district and encourage neighbors to be involved in any proposed future changes. There is a recommendation from the staff to separate the proposed guidelines into several parts, each of which will be considered separately by the commission. That seems like a good idea, and John and I further support consideration of proposed changes. But we ask that the commission adopt a resolution today that these guidelines will be a proposal that is offered to conservation, conservation zoning districts as an option, and the proposal will only become formal guidelines for a district if the residents of that district indicate majority support for the change, as when they originally voted and we went door to door, I personally did, to ask if they wanted to participate in conservation zoning. This guidelines process, excuse me, this guidelines consolidation process has gone on for months beyond its original deadline. Public meetings and hearings are sometimes difficult for neighbors to attend. And after listening to the same content several times, people lose interest. It wears us down but we should not have to keep saying no over and over again. Unless we say yes, you do not have our agreement to make these changes for our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners again. Councilmember Brett Willers from District 6. Um, I. Um, took a vacation day from work today for a large number of council-related meetings. And it was very important to me to be able to attend this one in particular, uh, since finally, at least in partial form, the design guidelines updates are being considered. I don't know that I'll be able to make it to every one of those um, with my work schedule, but I appreciate being here today. And in particular, what I wanted to uh, hear more is what um, from some of my, uh, I still consider myself a neighborhood leader, um, I happen to be a council member, but, um, but wanted to hear some more feedback in particular from some of my fellow neighborhood uh, advocates um, about what their specific concerns were. Um, what I can tell you as a council member is that this process has had a whole lot more public input opportunities in a number of formats than virtually any legislation that the Metro Council has ever passed. Um, so I, I feel as though there has been a lot of notice. We have had a lot of stakeholders. We have 
have had opportunities for folks to attend a number of different meetings. We had some in East Nashville that were well attended. We have had opportunities for folks to post comments online. Um, I've. I'm struggling to f see how more uh, participation we could get other than literally re-canvassing the neighborhoods. And I, and I get that point. I did that myself in Eastwood when we expanded our conservation overlay when I was a neighborhood president. I mean, I knocked on a whole lot of those doors. Um, but for me, it comes back to, I believe that there has been a lot of public participation. Um, I do believe that having a standard set of guidelines with a separate chapter that says what's different about each different is a good approach. Um, I don't believe that that takes away from the uniqueness of each neighborhood. Um, it's conceivable to me that if there were something in one neighborhood's uh, history or context that would uh, diverge from the overall set that you could still accommodate that in that neighborhood's chapter. So I still feel like that is achievable. I wanna hear a little bit more maybe about what some of those things might be. I do feel like neighborhoods, at least in East Nashville, um, have participated fully, have taken advantage of this opportunity to fine tune their design guidelines. Um, the uh, Greenwood neighborhood, which I don't represent, but it's my next door neighbors across Gallatin and, and uh, I know them very well, but they've they've really taken opportunity to say, you know, for infill development, we actually want to limit the height a little bit more. That's um, something that they've struggled with in, in that district where there's a lot of interest in home building. Everything close to the pharmacy uh, has a lot of development pressure. Uh, and so they wanted to refine that a little bit more. Uh, I feel like some neighborhoods have taken an opportunity, it sounds like Richland West End as well, to say, you know, we actually would like to refine it a little bit more and those neighborhoods feel as though um, there has been a public process through which that's been announced and decided upon. And I kind of feel like it would be a shame to have gone through all that process with public input and then to throw it out simply because of, um, a, a, because we haven't re-canvassed everything in the whole county. So uh, I understand those concerns. I want to learn a little bit more about what those concerns might be specifically. Some folks that I, I know and love and greatly respect have indicated that there are what they would describe as a whole lot of changes, and I'm going to want to maybe look back through what the changes are to see if I personally reached that conclusion that there are a lot of changes. Uh, I do get the point about ridge ranges. I appreciate that specificity. Um, but I uh, encourage the commission to continue moving forward. We do still have several more months where we can continue to refine some of those things. And, and again, I believe if, if specific neighborhoods have things that they're not comfortable with that are proposed or that they would like to add, that this is a very, very public process for, for vetting those and that the staff and the commission has the capacity uh, and the talent uh, and the commitment to uh, make sure that that's incorporated in the final document. So all I'm saying today is um, I, I appreciate the work of everyone who's participated so far. It's not 100% there yet. Deferral at the Metro Council, deferral is often good to have more discussion. It sounds like we're gonna have that uh, and just uh, would encourage the uh, board to uh, keep, keep moving forward uh, toward a final product again. I, uh, I was a champion of the outbuildings piece because uh, I know in East Nashville, we uh, applications for outbuildings consume more of your time than new construction uh, for new houses a lot of times. So I was a champion of the outbuildings piece. I think we did a lot of work there and just the, the final results um, were a little bit to, uh, you, I think there was probably too much freedom uh, that was proposed uh, for even even for myself. But I feel like with the design guidelines consolidations themselves, um, I think it's within a reasonable uh, frame of what the of what the deliberation is, and there have been plenty of opportunities, and still are opportunities for concerned homeowners to uh, uh, to weigh in on that. So. Those are my comments. I, I encourage the commission to, to keep moving forward, uh, but also to keep uh, listening to and hopefully refining some of the concerns that neighbors and neighborhood leaders and advocates have raised. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Karen Caladimos, and I'm at 907 Villa Place, and I'm in Edge Hill, so one of the newer overlays, um, in part because it's new, and in part because, um, personally, <laughs> um, I wasn't as involved, even though I did attend several meetings. I know that the council has done an incredible amount of work, but... Um, for extenuating cir circumstances, I was more focused on thinking that our overlay was going to change. 
So I didn't focus as much as I should have on the consolidation portion. Um, I did read today that when there is a conflict between the consolation consolidation portion and the specific district that the district would take priority. So that's just something to address some concerns. I don't know. Um, but I agree with much of what they said too. Um, and uh, I'm glad that part three is gone. <laughs> that's it. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. For today, we're still open, but we're, we're under discussion now. Okay. If I could, I, and not to take you away from the plan <laughs> to only talk about certain sections, but I thought this might be a good opportunity to bring up a couple of things I heard that you know, it's worthwhile to talk about all the time. <laughs> um, one of the things was that um, it it's, somewhat surprising to hear some of the, the comments about not wanting the consolidation overall, uh, because the whole impetus for all of this was because we've, as you well know, because you've been hearing it for the last few years, there's been a lot of concern that what you've been approving in terms of infill and additions primarily is too much. And so we were trying to address some of those issues, trying to address some of the things that have come up again that never we never anticipated, like rooftop decks. So that was really the real impetus for it. Um, there was a concern about um, ridge races. And that's something that wasn't even in the, it's, on, it's in, in as italicized information, but wasn't in some of the earlier design guidelines. And my understanding of it, because it was developed before my time, was that it was really a way to help people maximize their home without the expense of an addition that requires a footprint expansion because that's going to be more expensive. So if you can, you know, capture some of that upper level space, Ridgeways might be one way to do it. And so you'll see in your guidelines, all the guidelines have the same drawing showing that the Ridgeways is just a dormer out the back. Well, as people wanted more and more and more, that quickly became not just a dormer, but pulled into a much larger addition. So that was the thinking on all right, so maybe we should add in here, if you're using a ridge raise as part of your tools, maybe you can't use some of these others, and maybe the size of the addition should be regulated more closely. That was the thought on ridge raises. I know I've heard concerns that um, taking a lot of the information that's italicized to non-italicized language is a concern because you will then no longer have the discretion you have now. But as you well know, because you've done it, um, all day here today since two o'clock, um, you have the ability to interpret the guidelines, whether they're italicized or not, for every case on a case-by-case -case basis based on the realities of, those site, of that site. But it is a way to further collect how you have reviewed and how you've interpreted the guidelines in the last few years. Because our thinking was the more, that, more information we can get in the guidelines, the better tool they are for people. We're not leaving them guessing as to what you may or may not say. They can see it, they'll know. Um, and I think that was, oh, and I did want to point out too that you've heard, um, f other than um, the council member, you've heard from two dis districts out of 23, and I've called, or three districts out of 23, and I called up many of the stakeholders because we haven't heard from them recently, and I was worried about, wanted to hear their thoughts. And all the ones I was able to get felt very comfortable with it, and their neighbors, neighborhoods seemed to be comfortable with it, so I encourage you to keep that in mind too. I agree there's a lot more work that we can do, but I would hate to lose the whole thing and not address all of these concerns that we've been hearing over the last few years. And it really started with Belmont Hillsboro, and I think it was in 2011. Uh, we even had a charrette. There was so much concern over what was being approved. And since then, we've been trying to address those concerns. And of course, I have any questions if you want, but um, if you wanna take it in pieces, the first topic of discussion might be um, the introduction, which is the Secretary of Interior Standards.
Can we, can I make a general comment? First of all, um, I just wanna th thank the public so much for all of their input on this because we really do want to hear from you. I have read through every single comment that has been emailed, posted um, to Metro Historic. It did not take a short amount of time to do so. And I would just like to encourage the public in their comments to be specific. And I know the councilmen addressed this, but comments that just say we oppose this are not helpful. It's really helpful to hear the specifics of what you're excited to see in there or what you are, you know, what scares you and you don't want to see in there. So those specifics really help us understand what people are thinking. Um, Cause we are hearing, you know, some people feel like some of the, the revisions are too restrictive and some people are, are glad for them to be there. So we're working with, you know, people with different opinions and trying to figure out what's, what's best. And I guess I have a question, a question for you, Robin, if let's say, I think it was Hillsboro West End, if they oppose like the, the not being allowed the ridge rage and more than a 50% addition like that, comp that combination, is that something they could opt out of in their section? Yeah, it certainly could be addressed in individual sections. But again, I mean, we're already getting comments. We're already thinking about the revisions we might bring to you. So that may not even be in the final. Again, we, we wanna to hear too, and I appreciate you saying that, you know, specifically what the concerns are so that we know how to change it or if it needs to come out or if it's working. We don't wanna take one thing out because one person said it didn't work and we didn't hear from the 20 people who said it was fine uh, and vice versa. So yeah, so that's one way to handle it or it could come out completely or the language could be changed. Yeah, second or um, third them, you know, I also read through all the things and um, you know, a lot of things I, you just see the word changes and these changes, changes, but not a lot of specific, you know, I, we would like to hear what each neighborhood is like, hey, this is, we like this, you know, we are concerned about houses being too big, you know, so if you're a neighbor out there, you know, you have been concerned and voice concerned over the last several years, hey, you know, we do think these are, are getting too large and, you know, I don't think this is what we meant when we enacted these, you know, me as the neighbor talking now. Um, then you know I think you should voice that opinion. And us, on the other hand, if, if your neighbor that you, there is you know the one thing that I've heard today you know of, of all the the comments, the one specific that was brought up was the ridge raise and 50% addition. You know everything else is just the word changes. Um, so it's just seconding that that if there's something that you are concerned about that you would like you know that you like or what's happening or that you you want changed even however way you want. I feel like those things that in writing, especially, you know, email to Robin and staff, and then she disseminates that to us, and we can have time to read, digest, go through, um, and do all that. Uh, and then also, you know, the, the option to come to public meetings, and then we, you know, take notes and everything. But again, just saying, we, you know, we're not comfortable with these changes, it's not super helpful. I went to one of the community meetings, I believe the Belmont, community meeting and I think that the, the impression that I got was that the neighborhood worked so hard in getting together and talking to neighbors to get this conservation overlay done that they were afraid that or, or didn't like the fact that the rules were, were changing on them and um, and they and, and it, was, it was more of a, it seemed to me, more of a, a general fear of, we promised the neighbors one thing, and now we don't wanna go through this huge, big process again. Mm -hmm. and, and so it seemed like the comments were very general, mm -hmm. and it was just the fact that the guidelines were changing and how difficult it was to get them instituted in the first place. And so um, that is what I heard at the neighborhood meeting. And I just want to say that I understand uh, what you're going through and the, 
um, the angst it took to just get the conversation <coughs> on overlay in the first place. And so we are taking our time with this. We want to hear from you, and we want to hear, um, as everybody has indicated here, we want to get down to the nitty-gritty and, and see if we can come up with some sort of compromise. And so that's just my two cents. So getting back to Are you bringing us back to center. Yeah, so getting back to hearing your comments now, um, in in pieces, are there any concerns with section one, that part, portion of the introduction that talks about that that revises the Secretary of Inter Interior standards to meet the federal revised language, and adding that paragraph that further clarifies the role of the standards. I have no comment or, or criticism on that. I think it's a, a very uh, wise course of action. I work with the Secretary of Inst Interior Standards at work quite a lot, and I think that they're, frankly, pretty brilliant, the way they're, they're set up and the way they, they do allow for flexibility, um, but they're rooted in very ac accepted preservation, uh, historic preservation practice all across the country. That, and they've been around since 1966, if not before. So, yes, it's a very good way to start the entire process, the entire publication. Unless there's further comment, I'll take you to Section 8, Part 1, Relocation. And again, this is a section where we don't have that issue of slightly different language. It's exactly the same in all of them, and we're not proposing any changes to it. And I don't believe in my 10 years that we've even had a relocation. In your time, Sean? One. Where was that? Are you looking, are you referring to that grid, the Excel with the chain that you know, like the what it was, what it is. Where is, I'm trying to find, I thought I had it saved. Is it on the website? Yes, it's on the website. It's okay. under um, neighborhood. Um, yeah, so uh, it's. Comparisons, I think it's called. Um, okay. They're gonna work on getting up the exact language. Cause I know I looked I at it this weekend and I was it. trying to, couldn't find it again. But I can also pass around this if that helps. Yeah. That'd be good. I, I don't think I've seen any relocation on it on the oh. agenda since 2011. Not in the last 10 years. Yeah. That, that seems to be, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So we can always come back to it if it gets up on the screen. Yeah. Um, and then the next part is part one, section uh, nine, definitions. And Again, that's in your September version. Every design guideline's a little bit different. Some of them have new definitions, but more recent ones already have that definition. We haven't heard any comment, uh, public comment regarding the definitions. This may not fall under definitions, but there is actually an example used in one of the, uh, okay. one of the, um, applications today that just raised this question for me and I was wondering where it's addressed um, or if it would fall under a definition. But when we talk about setbacks and then you also have overhangs that extend beyond that setback and how we address overhangs in particular or you've got a zero setback and then all of a sudden your overhang is over a public sidewalk um, is what spurred <laughs> that question. But just wondering if if there's a way to address that in definitions or if that gets addressed elsewhere. That's a really good one and maybe one that should be added. Um, 
it's really more of a codes question, perhaps. I mean, it, it also really depends on what the overhang is. I mean, when you say overhang, I'm thinking a roof overhang. That's one thing. But what if the piece is a bay or a balcony or something like that? So that's something we could definitely look at adding in. Um, not that it's a big thing, but um, the one I was thinking of that was re, uh, relocation was actually moving a structure from outside the district into the district, so it was probably actually under new construction guidelines. So probably even then, I, 12 years we haven't done, done a relocation that I can think of. And I guess regardless if we've... <laughs> Regardless, don't don't jinx us, okay. <laughs> but regardless, if we've had many re relocations or not, I found the language in the relocation to be appropriate and and straightforward, and so it made sense. Okay, I'll keep going, but again, we can always come back if if you think of something. Um, the next piece is part two, which is all of the individual districts. Again, the vast majority of that is just collecting from the existing guidelines and making sure that those things that are specific to them are not lost. Uh, but of course, it also includes the map and a short history. And some of the short histories have been revised, um, thanks to Ms. Baldock for some of those, because um, they were badly in need of being revised. Um, Belmont Hillsboro, uh, and again, this is what we talked about in September, Belmont Hillsboro and Bowling House District, they've long had some italicized information about if a building, if infill is two stories, then it should have a hipped roof. So that's in there. Again, Cherokee Park and the stone adding to the infill options. Um, Elmington, it was a change to their short history. Greenwood, um, a new short history. Also, that neighborhood wanted to set the maximum number of stories to one and a half. There are um, two two-story historic buildings, I believe. Correct me if that's wrong. Um, and so they just wanted to clarify. And again, the only thing we have heard is that yes, they want that. We haven't heard anyone say they don't want that. Lachlan Springs had some information about MDHA, their, their review district, but that's going away next year. So we took that out. It was italicized anyway. Maxwell House has a new short history. Uh, Woodlawn West, we added that italicized information that you uh, accepted as a policy recently in terms of attached garages in that neighborhood. And those are the only changes. Everything else is existing and moved to those sections. That makes a lot of sense to me. It sounds good. Mm -hmm. I don't have any issues with it. For the, when going through those, what, we have 23 districts? Mm -hmm. Um, several of them have hit, had the history listed but n didn't have any additional design guidelines. Is that because they, because that district hasn't reached out with any? Right, and they didn't have any existing guidelines that were specific to them. Speci okay, so um, so it's really, it's, it's about, it's about half of them that mm -hmm. do and half that don't, so. Um, yeah, we just want to hear more from those districts or from or from the other ones. I, I don't know that it's hear it more from them. It's just they didn't have anything to begin with to move to that section. I mean, they may want to, you know, now come forward and say something, but I don't know. It's not because we haven't heard from them. It's because they didn't have an existing language to move into that section. And then, sorry, then again, part three, the recommendation is just to remove it altogether. Um, I personally, I love the idea of it. I think it was a good idea, but there's too much work that needs to go in to making it work that, and obviously, like I said before, that we just don't have the funding for. Yeah, that, I mean, it is, like kind of a shame, you know, just there's so much work done. I thought it was a really nice, you know, well-presented book. You know, I really liked the, again, like Robin, you just said the idea of it. Um, but even I was a little uncomfortable with some of the things of just, you know, picking and then 
you know, like if you had a one-story house, you could still put a two-story outbuilding, you know, so that type thing. And then by the t I feel like by the time you made all those differences per lot, you're doing the same amount of work you were doing. I don't know, you know, so if the goal is staff time and, you know, s you know, just streamlining, you know, saving money, time, you know, everything like that, then I don't know if just how it was and the few issues that people had, if that was achieved, you know, so then it's just creating more work. But I mean, I did, I did really like the idea and that, you know, if it, if it had just worked well to, for staff and everything, but um, I mean, if I feel like if it caused so many issues that staff is saying, you know, we would like to not go forth and I think that I, I would I would follow that I would agree with that yeah I'm a bit saddened it didn't work yeah. out um, I also going through all of the public comments there were so many of them I don't know if I would say predominantly but I would think predominantly I kept like highlighting the outbuilding comments mm -hmm. and there were so many outbuilding comments and concerns and I feel like this is um, uh, just a great example of you all listening to the public and the commissioners and and making that decision to pull pull the plan and to address it in uh, section seven. So thanks. While I'm on a roll with thanking people, um, uh, thank you to the State Historic Preservation Office, the Tennessee Historical Commission for helping us pay for that. Um, although, I'm assuming you're going to uh, take it out. You know, again, this is just our recommendation we're talking about right now. I, I don't feel like it was a total loss. I think it was a good process and we, we got a lot of information out of it and who knows, maybe it's something that comes back in 15 years or maybe it's even something that helps another Tennessee community. Um, so I don't think it's a complete loss. Um, also, there's, there were several comments. Uh, you had talked about staff time. Some of the public had talked about staff time. None of this has to do with staff time. Um, this is, that's not why we're recommending this level of changes and this level of, of public input. We thought we were addressing what we were hearing from the public for the last few years, and we thought we were making things easier on applicants. Uh, that was the whole role. Our time is, is not really important in this discussion. Um, and I wanted to clarify that assuming that you vote for the deferral, that these discussions, you're not, this has been a little bit of a confusion, you're not voting on these sections. And in January, you will not be voting on what you're discussing then, nor in February. You won't be voting on anything until March. And, and I appreciate, this is our opportunity to hear your comments as well as the public's. So unless there are other comments, you might be able to uh, take a motion for what to defer or to disapprove or anything else you want to do. What is the commission's present thoughts? I'd like to hear that. I personally don't have any more comments uh, on what we've talked about today. I'm happy to defer uh, and keep public hearing open until next meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, with the outline, yes, you, you're in line with the guidelines or, or outline of the timeline for. Yeah, I think it works okay. well to give us plenty of time. All right. I mean, and as Robin stated, we can talk about anything that's brought up mm -hmm. in any of these meetings, but it's giving us, as a commission, since we're we don't get to talk about this besides here no. and discuss this and work through these, so. Um, it gives us a way to break it down for our discussion, but we'll, of course, hear public discussion and discuss those items that are brought up um, at those meetings. Agree? Agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, our vice chair just walked out, and maybe they have. Um, hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, I was out, I was out, but um, I, I do have that concern about outbuildings and how if they were left to their own devices or those 20 different plans that, you know, does it diminish the house? Is it no longer that the historic structure is um, 
compromised. Um, you know, that they could build a two-story or a three-story or whatever, um, that, that's not, I don't think I can wrap my brain around that. Um, because our, our purview is preservation of a historic structure uh, as much as possible. So I think that's, I, I, I also have that um, concern. And I mean, it, there was a lot of work that went into that, but it, it was a bit confusing for me um, on just saying, here's these plans that you could build and you don't need to have any approval on that. So, um, I don't think we, as a commission, we've have that kind of, um, you know, thought process. Yeah. Um, I guess also, you know, we always hear about property owners concerned about their property rights and I guess on our side of the table, we don't, you know, that's not what our our belief system is, I guess. It's just that, you know, it's more of here's a guideline that you can uh, protect your, your historical structure. So um, that is a delicate um, voice, and I think we hear it very loud and clear. Um, but I think that's not where we go with that. We, we want to continue to do that. And I, I heard that today from uh, the neighbors there. I, and I think this particular neighborhood association is, is very active in your preservation, as, uh, also as District 6. And so I think that's where our staff hears your voice loud and clear um, versus the other 20 that aren't loud and clear. Um, and you've, you've worked on your preservation guidelines way over the years. So you own it um, and hold it dear. So um, I, I hear you. I think our commission hears you on how you're saying if it's going to add more um, complication, then that's what we would need to be sensitive to. I hear that. Okay. Um, yes, please. Would you like to do that since you've been our rep? <laughs> uh, yeah, and to, yeah. Um, to defer and to approve the schedule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So regarding the consolidation of neighborhood conservation zoning overlay, um, the process, I make a motion to approve the posted schedule of uh, items being you know, discussed at each monthly meeting and to defer until a final draft until March of 2020. Okay, and we will keep public hearing open. Yes, the motion, second. Okay. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay, there's none opposed, so we have passed on that motion. Thank you. And I'll add to that, we are happy to take your comments via email as well, if, you, if after your discussion you have more comments. Okay. I do have some announcements yeah. for you. Yeah, and yeah. Um, Marathon Village, uh, I'm anticipating that a short request for historic preservation zoning overlay will be before you early next year. Um, we are talking with very, very early initial discussions with two neighborhoods um, on the north side of town, Haynes Heights and Hillhurst, about mm -hmm. a potential historic Haynes zoning Heights. overlay. Um, College Hill is in the mix as well, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure if they're quite ready to move forward. Um, again, we've in, been invited to Richland West End's meeting on November 21st, and again, available to come to anyone's meeting about anything, anytime. Um, and congratulations to Lee Fitz for Hastings Architecture being oh. named the number three architecture firm in the U.S. by Architecture Magazine. Wow. Very cool. We also have set up... Um, an agency page on next door. So we're hoping this is yet one more way we have to get information out to people. You can define your geographic area so that you're only sending things to those people. Hmm. So that means we can get things directly out to the neighborhoods that we serve. 
And we have also been working on, um, uh, Council Member Syracuse has started a potential tax incentive. Mm -hmm. It's state enabled. So the program closely follows what the state enabling legislation says. They've done it in Rutherford County. They've just um, voted on their first recipient of it. And what it is, it's a tax abatement program. So the idea is that if you have a property that maybe is in pretty poor shape and it needs at least $50,000 worth of work or more, that you can freeze that value at its unimproved rate for 10 years. So the city doesn't get less tax dollar. It continues to get the same amount of tax dollars it, it does on the day that this starts. But then in 10 years, they get the benefit of that improvement. But it also gives someone a little bit of a break on taxes during that 10-year mm -hmm. period to help pay for the rehab. Yeah. So that's just in very general terms how it would work. Um, and again, that I'm hoping if the bill is approved by council, then it comes to you to approve the details of the program, and then every project would come to you as well. So I'm hoping we may have that to you wow. in January or February. And so will you have details? I've been following the press on this, and it seems like it's going to be very complicated to figure out what kind of properties, who qualifies, when. <laughs> will you come to us with recommendations of all of that? Yes, and I think it <laughs> won't be very complicated. Okay. But that'll be up to you to decide. But we're trying to make it as uncomplicated as possible for everybody. Will it mirror federal tax incentives for preservation? No, it probably won't be interiors, first of all. Um, and the federal tax credits are an income tax credit, and this is a property tax abatement. Um, so again, I think it should be fairly simple. Uh, it will probably be only for properties that are in an overlay, so that it is an incentive to come into an overlay or to be landmarked, and um, we'll capture that value that's already available on the property assessor's website and hold that for 10, and the trustee's office will hold that for 10 years before they start mm -hmm. charging them more. Could, it could Hopefully. run away and be very successful, and will it be adding to your wonderful staff's workload, or will you be hiring? <laughs> mm -hmm. people? It potentially because could it, the, add. The big deal with federal is there's a three-part process. There's tons of paperwork you have to verify in the field that they've actually done what they said they were going to do, and you know, it's a lot of work, I mean, potentially. Yeah. Well, on the the paperwork side of it, again, we're trying to keep it very simple. There probably won't be anything more than just collecting a couple pieces of information. The main part of it will be what you already do. It will be us writing a report and bringing the project to you and saying, does this meet the standards? Um, does this meet the guidelines? Or designating a property if it's not already designated. So it might mean a little more work, but the it's a short-term requirement for a long-term benefit, which is getting those properties protected for the long-term. <laughs> okay. I mean, so we could have, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, Pretty, almost any of our normal actions that we take in a meeting could potentially be one of these projects. Right. So will it be rolled up into each review that we do already? That at the end mm -hmm. of it will be also mm -hmm. a tax, a tax abatement. It'll be seamless for you. Okay. It you'll be reviewing the work just like you always do. Mm -hmm. Now there'll be parts of the report to tell you that hey, this is a tax abatement project. I um, mean, here are the guidelines you're following. But other than that, it'll be fairly seamless. Will there be, be con ability for consideration of, okay, we have a contributing house here. It's a small house. The only way we're going to be able to approve zoning uh, the appropriate, um, that, it, that it meets the guidelines is we're going to blow the, the back out to an enormous addition. It's no longer going to be contributing. So do they get the tax credit? That would be up for you to, you to decide. Um, you will not, the, the tax abatement won't be available for the value of new construction. Again, I'm, I'm, these, these answers are all based on a draft. I don't know ultimately what will come to you. But the idea is to only abate the rehab. <coughs> there's there's going to be a lot of questions. Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Robin, this is going to be approved by council, correct? Uh, well, I don't know if they'll it's approve it or not. I mean, that's or the hope. They'll. they'll yeah, they have because we are in a tenuous I, tax situation, I, right? I think our council member would probably know he's, more he's, about it. I, I suspect the council member Syracuse has the vote. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> so, and then, and then the program, all these kinds of details will come to you to approve before anything happens. Yeah. 
so we have one more acknowledgement for the day. Yes, we do. And it's very important because, you know, we, Susan Jones, <laughs> this is uh, our last meeting with you. And um, we want to thank you so much for your service to us. Um, My pleasure. I understand you have been with Metro since 2002. I have, yeah. And you've been with MHZC since 2012. Mm -hmm. And you are the assistant attorney with the Deve Department of Law for Metro. So um, we honor you Thank and um, wish you much success and blessing in whatever you um, do in your next little decade of your life. So not little life, <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> little <laughs> life. Let me, let me. Longevity life <laughs> and quality of life. I, I appreciate that very much. It has, um, it has been my goal to provide you with the best possible legal advice that I can provide you with. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope and pray that I have done that. Um, it has been my pleasure to work with and to serve with you and to work with uh, Robin and Tim and the entire staff. This is an outstanding department and the council people, of course. Mm -hmm. um, this is an outstanding department that is um, very thorough in the information that they provide to you all for your consideration. You all are very thoughtful in the way that you go about um, looking at the information that's provided. And, and I hope that we've been able to offer some level of guidance that assists you in Absolutely. your charge. So thank you very much for those very kind words. Absolutely. And, and I will cherish my time with, yes. with the Department of Law, with Metropolitan Government, as well as with the Historic Zoning Commission as well. Yes. We're going to miss you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> And I think we're adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We're adjourned. Okay. Contact information. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.